everyone and welcome to Dear Mr. Potter. I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. I'm Alistair Stevens and this week in our 57th session we embark upon our journey to the very end of Goblet of Fire. We're going to be looking at the end of chapter 35, Veritaserum. We're going to be looking at chapter 36, The Parting of the Ways, and chapter 37, The Beginning. We have a truly ambitious number of slides to get through. So let's get started immediately by picking up with the Veritas Serum Enhanced Interrogation of Bartimius Crouch Jr. here in Chapter 35. You will recall, of course, that we have covered the Wizarding, uh, the, the Quidditch World Cup back at the beginning of the book and the somewhat convoluted and arcane set of circumstances which accompanied that event. You'll also recall, of course, that we have talked about the the somewhat unceremonious dispatch of uh, Bartimius Crouch the Senior and the return of Voldemort, of course. So let's get into our, uh, our interrogation scene, picking up with the Marauders map and the Invisibility Cloak. Map, said Dumbledore quickly. What map is this? Potter's map of Hogwarts. Potter saw me on it. Potter saw me stealing more ingredients for the Polyjuice Potion from Snape's office one night. He thought I was my father. We have the same first name. I took the map from Potter that night. I told him my father hated dark wizards. Potter believed my father was after Snape. For a week I waited for my father to arrive at Hogwarts. At last, one evening, the map showed my father entering the grounds. I pulled on my invisibility cloak and went down to meet him. He was walking around the edge of the forest. Then Potter came and crumb. I waited. I could not hurt Potter. Potter. My master needed him. Potter ran to get Dumbledore. I stunned Crumb. I killed my father. No! wailed Winky. Master Barty, Master Barty, what is you saying? You killed your father, Dumbledore said in the same soft voice. What did you do with the body? Carried it into the forest, covered it with the invisibility cloak. I had the map with me. I watched Potter run into the castle. He met Snape. Dumbledore joined them. I watched Potter bringing Dumbledore out of the castle. I walked back out of the forest, doubled around behind them, went to meet them. I told Dumbledore Snape had told me where to come. Dumbledore told me to go and look for my father. I went back to my father's body, watched the map. When everyone was gone, I transfigured my father's body. He became a bone. I buried it while wearing the invisibility cloak in the freshly dug earth in front of Hagrid's cabin. There was complete silence now, except for Winky's continued sobs. Then Dumbledore said, And tonight? I offered to carry the Triwizard Cup into the maze before dinner, whispered Barty Crouch. Turned it into a port key. My master's plan worked. He has returned to power, and I will be honoured by him beyond the dreams of wizards. The insane smile lit his features once more, and his head drooped onto his shoulder as Winky wailed and sobbed at his side. And so the mystery of Mr. Crouch is finally, and somewhat terminally, laid to rest. You'll note here the powerful adoption of both the Marauder's Map and the Invisibility Cloak, and Invisibility Cloak, I suppose, by Barty Crouch Jr. here. And it's very tempting to, to read into his actions here an echo of Harry's own actions. Harry, too, of course, has used the Invisibility Cloak and the Marauder's Map in concert to go where he ought not to go, to do what he ought not to do. And we're drawing here throughout this chapter, throughout tonight's reading, throughout the end of this book, and I dare say throughout the rest of the series too, we're drawing very clean distinctions between what is good and what is evil. This, of course, is a consequence of the collapse, the utter and outright ruinous collapse of basically wizarding society. We're going to formalize this in the next chapter, of course, with the parting of the ways, with Cornelius Fudge's outright rejection of the return of Voldemort and his inability to reconcile his position in society with this uh, egregious and awful turn of events. He's going to struggle with this. The entire wizarding community is going to struggle with this. And there is going to be something perilously close to, well, an outright civil war, I suppose, perilously close to, by which I mean, that's basically what we're going to get in the span of the next couple of books. Harry is going to continue to break rules, and Harry is going to continue to exist outside of his community. He is going to continue to be exceptional in the ways that heroes are exceptional, particularly protagonists, particularly eponymous protagonists. He is going to continue to drive the action and to make those calls, those judgment calls, about what is right and what is wrong. There is nothing inherent to the invisibility cloak which bespeaks evil. Harry has used the invisibility cloak many times and accomplished great things through it, either 
capital G great things or lowercase g great for Harry things. I'm thinking of his his trip to Hogsmeade, for example, which has fortuitous consequences, but isn't in and of itself a noble or even virtuous act, isn't in and of itself even, I would, I would argue, a just act. There are reasons why Harry ought not to go to Hogsmeade in Prisoner of Azkaban, and yet he does it Anyway, that is what Harry Potter does. The using of the Marauder's Map, of course, works in a very similar fashion. This granting of knowledge, the ability to navigate Hogwarts in particular, not just within the frame of the map, though, of course, the map relates to Hogwarts, but not just Hogwarts as a place that is indicated on the map, but Hogwarts as an institution, Hogwarts as a symbol of something which we still hold to be more pure and more good and more just than the rest of the Wizarding World, the ability to navigate Hogwarts in this sly manner, the ability to to exert this knowledge and to control one's circumstances in a supernatural fashion, even by the standards of, of Hogwarts. That is to say, of course, the Marauder's Map is magic. Of course, everyone at Hogwarts uses magic, but the Marauder's Map is a very specific and unusual kind of magic. Harry is still breaking the rules of his community here, and that well, that is going to have enormous consequences and enormous thematic inference going forward. So that distinction is already being drawn, has already been established, right? Going back to Azkaban, even, I might argue, going all the way back to Chamber of Secrets, when Harry first finds himself as, as, as an outcast, as a, a figure of suspicion, what Harry does with the tools given to him, what Harry does with the skills that he commands... Those things are good because Harry is good. There is apparently very little distinction, with one bold exception, right? There is one kind of magic, one one toolkit available to us, which is irrevocably on one side of that light-dark divide, and that toolkit is the unforgivable curses. They are unforgivable for a reason. Only dark wizards are going to touch that kind of magic. There are, of course, other older forms of magic, both for good such as Lily's Sacrifice, and for evil, such as the resurrection spell that was used to uh, bring Voldemort back. But we're not really going to, to tread too deeply into that territory in the course of the series. We're going to get some, some touches upon that material as we move forward. But we're going to continue to bear in mind Harry's exceptionalism is a product or... Oh, hmm. Okay, let me be careful here, because this is, kind of, uh, this is kind of reflexive. This is kind of circular logic here. Harry's virtue is a consequence of his exceptionalism, and his exceptionalism is a consequence of his virtue. Not the fact that he is the boy who lived. Not the fact that he is the boy who vanquished Voldemort. That is something now that is going to actually adhere itself to Harry's character. This idea of the curse that failed, our greater understanding of who Harry is and how that encounter with Voldemort played out, that is going to be a pretty powerful and consistent part of Harry's character going forward. Harry has now been, narratively speaking, freed from his backstory. He is freed from the burden that was placed upon him, but his exceptionalism remains. So we're going to continue to draw very clean lines of distinction between what is good and what is evil through the rest of the series, as well as muddying those waters somewhat too from time to time. But generally speaking, we're going to, to draw a pretty clean distinction between right and wrong, between good and evil going forward, no matter the tools that we use or the way that we engage with the people around us. So we see here that uh, that um, Barty Crouch Jr. cannot hurt Potter. My master needed him. Potter ran to get Dumbledore. I stunned Crumb. I killed my father. Again, we're getting this fantastic J.K. Rowling attributed dialogue here for, for Barty Crouch. This is so spare and blunt. One of my favorite details that we get here, this isn't the first time that it comes up, but I don't think that we mentioned it last week, so I'll call it out here. It's it's really quite lovely. You killed your father, Dumbledore said in the same soft voice. What did you do, what did you do with the body? Carried it into the forest, covered it with the invisibility cloak. I had the map with me. I watched Potter run into the castle, he met Snape, Dumbledore joined them. Barty Crouch is apparently not aware of the fact or cognizant of the fact, or at least not reflecting in his grammatical choices, the fact that it is Dumbledore who is questioning him. Dumbledore is an abstract figure who, who played a part in the events that, that Barty Crouch is describing at this point. He's not interacting with, with Dumbledore at this point as much as he is just giving this account, which is broken only by those spare and infrequent smiles, which are just increasingly troubling as you read through this account. The transfiguration of Crouch's body into a bone, of course, reflective of the bone of the father that is used in the uh, resurrection spell, the resurrection ceremony for Voldemort. It's unclear whether or not Crouch, uh, whether or not Barty Crouch Jr. is uh, is mindful of that detail, and that this is a 
this is a purposeful part of, of this plan that he is echoing his master's great plan at this point, or if this is just a connection, if this is just a symbolic connection, this is, you know, the, the, the bones of the father as being such an important part of our understanding of really the entire Harry Potter mythos, right? The entire story of Harry Potter is kind of sins of the fathers, right? That is the setup is just, yeah, terrible things happen. Terrible things were done. Terrible things were done by good people. Terrible things happened to good people. And of course, terrible things were done by evil, dark wizards. And we have inherited this world. We have inherited this this huge obstacle to overcome, this huge challenge to our life and our liberty, to our understanding of the world, to our hope for a better tomorrow, for all of these things. And this pairs beautifully with Harry's flourishing adolescent awareness, right? I just talked about this catastrophic, ruinous collapse of the entire wizarding world, which we're going to get codified by Cornelius Fudge in the next chapter. All of this is reflective of that adolescent experience that we described before. Harry is moving into a kind of political awareness, and I'm using political here in the broadest, most, most social sense, I suppose. He is not concerned with specific politics in the way that Hermione Granger is concerned with specific politics, at least intermittently in the course of this book. He is concerned with a political awareness, with a social awareness. He is realizing that the world is, in fact, corrupt. We see... In, in Philosopher's Stone, a pretty generous and benevolent wizarding world that is brought low by individuals, right? Voldemort was evil and did evil things, and some evil people served Voldemort, and some, some people of good heart were corrupted by Voldemort, Professor Quirrell, of course, in the first book. Then in Chamber, we get a slightly more complicated evolution of that. In Prisoner of Azkaban, we get a much more complicated and mature in the adolescent sense, uh, exploration of that. And now we have deconstructed the wizarding world. The wizarding world is now not to be trusted. Let's keep pushing on here. Um, good, good. Uh, let me see here as I, as I try and catch up with the chat. You guys, I know this is just going to be a nightmare to try and keep up with the chat tonight. Uh, Middle Mara is joining us saying, this is my first live podcast. Fantastic. But I've already lost what Alistair was talking about. I know trying to keep up with the chat and listen to the, 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 the words that I speak, it's a, it's a huge challenge, particularly when I'm moving as quickly as I am this evening. Don't worry, the podcast will be available later this evening. I'm going to try and just very cleanly edit this and get it out uh, in short notice. So if you're having trouble keeping up with the chat, oh, live audience, and you also want to hear my thoughts on the end of Harry Potter, don't worry, you'll get the opportunity in just a couple of hours' time. Let's move on then to our second slide with Harry telling his story. Dumbledore stopped talking. He sat down opposite Harry behind his desk. He was looking at Harry, who avoided his eyes. Dumbledore was going to question him. He was going to make Harry relive everything. I need to know what happened after you touched the portkey in the maze, Harry, said Dumbledore. We can leave that till morning, can't we, Dumbledore, said Sirius harshly. He'd put a hand on Harry's shoulder. Let him have a sleep. Let him rest. Harry felt a rush of gratitude towards Sirius, but Dumbledore took no notice of Sirius's words. He leaned forward toward Harry. Very unwillingly, Harry raised his head and looked into those blue eyes. If I thought I could help you. Dumbledore said gently, by putting you into an enchanted sleep and allowing you to postpone the moment when you would have to think about what has happened tonight, I would do it. But I know better. Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you. I ask you to demonstrate your courage one more time. I ask you to tell us what happened. The phoenix let out one soft, quavering note. It shivered in the air, and Harry felt as though a drop of hot liquid had slipped down his throat into his stomach, warming him and strengthening him. He took a deep breath and began to tell them. As he spoke, visions of everything that had passed that night seemed to rise before his eyes. He saw the sparkling surface of the potion that had revived Voldemort. He saw the Death Eaters apparating between the graves around them. He saw Cedric's body lying on the ground beside the cup. So a couple of important beats here, of course. The defense of Harry by Sirius Black is not in any way unexpected, I think, but heartwarming nonetheless. The restoration of Harry's strength and spirit by the Phoenix Song, echoing that encounter that we had back in the graveyard in Little Hangleton, of course, too. But most importantly here, well, this is a brand new Dumbledore. And I don't think that it was immediately transparent to me my first time through the series, even my second time through this series, how powerfully Dumbledore is changed at that moment when he breaks into the office and confronts who he believes, or I guess it doesn't believe, but, but who is, is presenting themselves as Alistair Mad-Eye Moody. 
We talked last time about Dumbledore in that moment being uncloaked, uncloaked in his fury, uncloaked in his power. This is who Dumbledore really is. Beneath the facade of the harmless bumbling wizard, Dumbledore is the most powerful man in the world. He is the only rival to Voldemort in terms of power. He is the only person of whom Voldemort is afraid. And what's most powerful about that moment is that Dumbledore never really resets. He never really goes back to the way that he was. This is a huge moment of transition for the Harry Potter series, and it's a moment that, that may well elude the reader the first time through the series, or the second, third, fourth, fifth time through the series, because it is so complete, it is anchored in the foundation stones of Dumbledore's character. And these are foundations that we are, at this point in the series, somewhat familiar with. We've seen a power beneath the surface of Dumbledore, right from the beginning of Philosopher's Stone. We have sensed that power, and we have sensed his great fortitude and his great courage and his great kindness. But this is a Dumbledore who now has to take action. He is being moved into action and active agency, if you like, if that isn't a little tautological. He's being moved into active agency by circumstances beyond his control, and he is just not going to be the same Dumbledore. This moment, by the way, more than any other makes me wish that Richard Harris had been around to perform, to, to contribute to the rest of the Harry Potter movies. I am, as I have said before, as I'm sure many of you are, no great fan of Michael Gambon in that role. I don't think that his Dumbledore is nuanced or thoughtful or careful or rich enough. I don't care for the performance, and it is that is a problem which is exacerbated by Gambon's unfamiliarity with the text. And I noticed there was some chat uh, earlier in the, uh, in, the chat, in the live chat just before we got started about Michael Gambon never reading the books, and I believe David Tennant never reading the books either, who gives us just an outlandish, somewhat magnetic, somewhat engaging, somewhat fascinating performance as Barty Crouch. I don't hate that performance the way that many people hate that performance, partly because I am just so charmed by David Tennant, quite honestly. But like Michael Gambon, he is giving something that is not, to my mind and to my reading of the text, both the text of the novel and the text of the movie adaptation, completely purposeful or sufficiently thoughtful. I wish that we had got to see Richard Harris in this Dumbledorean mode, I think it would have been magnificent. Michael Gambon, unfortunately, just, yeah, not really, not really doing it uh, for me. Yeah, yeah. Let me see, <laughs> Vicati saying, when Harry describes the depth and blue of Dumbledore's eyes, I thought his next sentence was going to be, and I fell madly absolutely in love. I don't know why I just do. That's magnificent. I don't know why either, Vicati, but I love that quite uh, quite a lot. Yes, um, yes. Okay, good. Uh, we'll, we'll just kind of keep that in our back pocket, I suppose, for our fan fiction going forward. All of this is to say, of course, Dumbledore's uncloaked nature at this point is reflected here in his attitude toward Harry. He is every bit as gentle and every bit as kind as he has been previously, but he is more firm. He is more insistent, and the actions that he takes and the actions that he expects of those around him are simply more necessary. He is not now protecting Harry in the way that he has explicitly protected Harry previously. He is still caring for Harry, but he is recognizing Harry as... Well, as, as a peer, I think, at this point, for perhaps the first time. I think that he recognizes in Harry not just potential, not just a fate, not just a destiny, not just, you know, uh, the, the curse of greatness and exceptionalism, but actual accomplishment. Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it, he says here. Uh, yeah, no, I could numb you. I could send you into an enchanted sleep. I could give you a draft of a potion that will make sure that you don't dream. I'm actually going to do that by proxy in just a few pages' time. But right now, I need to know. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you. And I don't think that this is Dumbledore flattering Harry for a moment. This is Dumbledore recognizing Harry's courage and, and, and you know, Gryffindorian quality here, I suppose. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you. I ask you to demonstrate your courage one more time. I ask you to tell us what happened. I am not going to protect you now, Harry. I need you to step up. This is important stuff. And of course, Harry does. Almost reliving those memories and it's unclear to me the mechanism by which that is occurring. Is this simply psychological? Is this just Harry who has been in a shocked state? Harry who returns from the graveyard in Little Hangleton disoriented and confused and in a, a clinical state of shock, I'm sure, and then gets that shock compounded by the, the reveal of Alistair Moody and all the many reveals of Barty Crouch Jr.? 
Harry is in shock at this point. Is this externalization of his thought process just a simple psychological consequence of that? He took a deep breath and began to tell them as he spoke visions of everything that had passed the, uh, that had passed that night seemed to rise before his eyes. Well, it could be. It could be that he is reliving this experience and thus integrating it more fully into his conscious memory, as it were. It could simply be that there is a clinical psychological account of what is happening to Harry in this moment. But we did just talk about the pensive quite a lot. And the idea of visions of the past appearing before Harry does seem to be somewhat similar to uh, the kind of mechanistic function of the pensive, if not the actual, the, the, the representation of the pensive, right? There's no pulling of silvery strands of thought from Harry's temple here, but nonetheless, he is kind of reliving and, and revisiting those memories. I find that fascinating and a little ambiguous in this moment. Let's get into the, uh, let's get into, uh, C-Star saying, I always assumed it was simply psychological, but in this setting, you never know. No, you really don't. There could have just been, you know, a very subtle wave of a wand, and actually this is going to help. Or more crucially, I suppose, more, more, more tangibly, more interestingly, this could be a consequence of Fox's song. This could be something that the phoenix is doing to Harry, rousing within Harry. That's the actual magical effect that we see here. The phoenix let out one soft, quavering note. It shivered in the air, and Harry felt as though a drop of hot liquid had slipped down his throat into his stomach, warming him and strengthening him. Not dissimilar to whatever draft it was that uh, that Barty Crouch Jr. masquerading as Mad-Eye Moody fed to Harry back in his office, right? <clears throat> so we don't quite know the, the mechanism of this interaction, but it is fascinating. It is a little provocative. Let's conclude chapter 35 with the overview, in fact, the long-awaited overview of the Priori Incantatum. The reverse, <clears throat> excuse me, the reverse spell effect, said Sirius sharply. Exactly, said Dumbledore. Harry's wand and Voldemort's wand share cause. Each of them contains a feather from the tail of the same phoenix. This phoenix, in fact, he added, and he pointed at the scarlet and gold bird perching peacefully on Harry's knee. My wand's feather comes from Fox, Harry said, amazed. Yes, said Dumbledore. Mr. Ollivander wrote to tell me you had bought the second wand the moment you left his shop four years ago. So what happens when a wand meets its brother, said Sirius. They will not work properly against each other, said Dumbledore. If, however, the owners of the wands force the wands to do battle, a very rare effect will take place. One of the wands will force the other to regurgitate spells it has performed in reverse, the most recent first, and then those which preceded it. He looked interrog interrogatively at Harry, and Harry nodded. Which means, said Dumbledore slowly, his eyes upon Harry's face, that some form of Cedric must have reappeared. Harry nodded again. Diggory came back to life, said Sirius sharply. No spell can reawaken the dead, said Dumbledore heavily. All that would have happened is a kind of reverse echo. A shadow of the living Cedric would have emerged from the wand. Am I correct, Harry? He spoke to me, Harry said. He was suddenly shaking again. The, the ghost Cedric, or whatever he was, spoke. An echo, said Dumbledore, which retained Cedric's appearance and character. I am guessing other such forms appeared, less recent victims of Voldemort's wand. An old man, Harry said, his throat still constricted. Bertha Jorkins, and... Your parents, said Dumbledore quietly. Yes, said Harry. So this is the long-awaited accounting of the uh, Priori Incantatum reverse spell effect, which we discussed a couple of weeks ago here on Dear Mr. Potter. I do want to parse some of what Dumbledore says here very carefully, right? When, when Sirius asks about this, so what happens when a wand meets its brother, said Sirius, said Sirius Black, a very skilled wizard in his own right. This is obviously extremely rare magic. And when we think about the racks and racks and racks of uh, wands in Ollivander's shop, that makes a certain amount of sense, right? The odds of two wands that share a common core coming into contact with one another, well, firstly, we don't know how many wands share cores. We don't know how many wands can be crafted from the, stra from the same, the, the feathers of the same phoenix. How many feathers can, can Fox possibly give to power wands? What about dragon heartstring? What about unicorn heart, right? We don't know exactly how that mechanic works. We don't know how those things are... I want to find a more gentle and genteel word than harvested, but I don't think that I can do so. Uh, we don't know how those things are harvested, so we don't know how common it is for wands to have brothers at all. But certainly it's rare enough that Sirius has never heard of this happening before, though he is somewhat familiar with the reverse spell effect. They will not work properly against each other, said Dumbledore. They will not work properly against each other. Two wands possessed of the same core will not work properly against each other. Period. End of sentence. End of thought. There is... 
no equivocation here. It's not under certain circumstances, ones bearing the same core or related cores, brother one, you know, kin ones, as it were, will sometimes have trouble interacting with... No, they will not work properly against each other. If, however, the owners of the ones force the ones to do battle, again, forcing the wand, implying a somewhat symbiotic relationship between wizard and wand and granting the wand a kind of identity which i find really fascinating this is of course an idea that is going to be wildly expanded as we move forward through the series but it's an idea which hasn't really occurred up until this point wands up to this point have been actually pretty interchangeable and pretty pretty crudely functional you know i'm in particular thinking of ron spellotaping his wand back together right is that something that we could do with wands at this point in the harry potter series is that something that jk rowling would be inclined to do at this point perhaps not wands seem to have taken on a greater identity and a greater sense of of presence and of purpose not just symbolic purpose not just as an adjunct to the wizard not just as a tool of the wizard but as objects and artifacts in and of themselves particularly these two wands of course if however the owners of the wands force the wands to do battle, a very rare effect will take place. Will take place. Not can take place, might take place, will take place. If you force two paired wands to do battle, you will get priori and cantatum. That will just happen. One of the wands will force the other to regurgitate spells it has performed in reverse. One of the wands will force the other, though you will remember the scene in the graveyard in Little Hangleton where Harry has to has to concentrate all of his power and might into forcing the little beads of light back into Voldemort's wand, which seems to be the trigger for the reverse spell effect. Is the wand doing that? Is Harry doing that? Is Harry doing that through the wand? Well, Dumbledore seems to be asserting one of the wands will force the other to regurgitate spells it has performed in reverse. It's possible that Harry isn't doing that at all uh, back in the graveyard, that this is Harry's wand kind of taking charge of the situation and forcing the other to, to regurgitate the spells it has performed in reverse, the most recent first and then those which preceded it, which gets us into that loophole back in the original edition of Goblet of Fire, where James emerges from Voldemort's wand before Lily, which is out of order and out of step with the established canon of events, which is why the book was revised, as we discussed in last week's session. Um, Oh, Joseph's saying he may be familiar with the reverse spell effect, or he may just understand Rolingian faux Latin. I defy anyone to understand Rolingian faux Latin, particularly priori incantatum. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how we conjugate uh, prior incantato. I, I discussed this before, I know, so I won't spend too much time on it. I don't know how we get from uh, prior incantato, which is the version of the spell cast by Amos Diggory at the beginning of Goblet of Fire, to priori incantatum. It may be that my knowledge of Latin is simply insufficient, but I did go looking at this. I promise I did my, I did my due diligence and my research on this, and I do not know... Of, of a legitimate uh, Latin formulation that gets us to priori and cantatum. It, it's not just, it's not a simple plural form. It's it's something much more complicated than that. And I don't really understand what it's doing. And also because of Rowling's faux Latin that we get throughout the Harry Potter series, I'm less inclined to see this as, as something purposeful as I am to see it simply as a, as a somewhat uh, euphonious expansion of the original spell form, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh my gosh, um, let me see here. Oh, someone just said, who said? Leo said, I have a first edition. Fantastic. That's it. So you have the, the, the wrong... Uh the wrong sequence there. Oh, Nikki was asking about it. Yes, good, good, yeah. Uh, did anyone ever notice that the ghosts are in the wrong order? Yes, only in the first edition. In, in, the, uh, in the first edition, apparently what happened was uh, while, they were, while they were right in the, the heart of the crunch process preparing for the publication of, of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, J.K. Rowling received galleys back from her editor with this error marked. Apparently the editor had just noticed, noted in the margin, uh, you have Lily coming out first, it should be James coming out first, and then Lily, and J.K. Rowling in her depleted and exhausted and overworked state apparently just fixed it by which i mean broke it and the first edition went out with the wrong order the editor was wrong jk rowling didn't think it through i guess and just took the editor's advice so made the wrong change and then in subsequent editions it was of course uh what well, uh, it was rectified recyclops here is saying um I always thought of wands more as resonators, especially since length and pliability seem so important. I feel like they want things like plants want light. They're active, but not necessarily conscious. I quite like that. That idea of, that idea of resonance, I actually rather like, right? That makes a lot of sense in the context of, you know, our visit to Ollivanders and the way that we talk about wands, well, the way that we talked about wands in Philosopher's Stone and then the way that we will talk about wands again much later in the series, that makes a certain amount of sense. There is a resonance between wizard and wand and as we've seen through Priori Incantatum, a resonance between these wands too 
I, I, I like that quite a lot. Yes, they have a a living quality to them. And I, I absolutely agree with you, Recyclops. I've always been intrigued by the pliability of the wand, by, by that particular quality. It's not always a good thing, and the absence of that pliability is not always a bad thing, particularly if you go on over to Pottermore and you happen to, for example, spend an afternoon browsing the kinds of wands that every significant figure in the Harry Potter mythos has has possessed over the years. I'm not saying that I did that, except that I definitely did do that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very fascinated by that. We will, of course, have the opportunity to talk uh, to talk much more freely about uh, about wands as we move forward. Ruhit saying, I know that James coming out of the, uh, coming out second is canonically accurate, but I actually dislike the corrected version. I find Lily being the one to tell Harry what he has to do much more powerful than when James does it in subsequent editions. Lily is protecting Harry in that scene just like she did 13 years ago. I completely agree, Rohit. I talked about this just a little bit last week, but it is disappointing for Lily to manifest there in front of Harry. Lily, who has been so immediately important in the context of this scene, right? We've just finished talking about the the ancient sacred magic, this 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 sacrificial charm that has protected Harry thus far. We've just finished talking about that and about the completely unprecedented sacrifice of his mother. And she shows up and the only thing she says to him is, uh, oh, uh, your dad will be along in just a minute and he will give you the advice that you need to go forward. Disappointing. Disappointing for Lily in that moment. I kind of wish that we had... Honestly, if if I have to both respect the, the canonicity of that sequence and make an edit that makes it work well for me... I kind of wish that Lily had emerged and that had been the last one. We obviously cut off. It is not the case that the first spell that Voldemort ever cast was the uh, Avada Kedavra curse on uh, on James Potter, right? So so we do cut off the priori incantatum effect at some point. We could have cut it off after Lily and we don't need his father to return at that point. I think that James is an unnecessary presence to be most generous and is, to take that one step further, actually somewhat dilutive of the consequence of, of Lily's manifestation in that moment. So, Rohit, you and I, as ever, thinking just, just right along the same lines. Yeah, yeah. And Becca saying, I really love stories about mom magic. I totally agree. Yes, that's that's the best way to put it. She, she saves him with mom magic and then should guide him again with mom magic. It's much more intentional, much more, uh, much more, uh, much more, well, to borrow a word that we've been using a lot this evening, much more resonant. That takes us to the end of chapter 35. Let's get into chapter 36 with Harry being reunited with his family. When Dumbledore pushed open the door, Harry saw Mrs. Weasley, Bill, Ron, and Hermione grouped around a harassed-looking Madame Pomfrey. They appeared to be demanding to know where Harry was and what had happened to him. All of them whipped around as Harry, Dumbledore, and the black dog entered, and Mrs. Weasley let out a kind of muffled scream. Harry! Oh, Harry! She started to hurry toward him, but Dumbledore moved between them. Molly, he said, holding up a hand, please listen to me for a moment. Harry has been through a terrible ordeal tonight. He has just had to relive it for me. What he needs now is sleep and peace and quiet. If he would like you all to stay with him, he added, looking around at Ron, Hermione, and Bill, too, you may do so, but I do not want you questioning him until he is ready to answer, and certainly not this evening. Mrs. Weasley nodded. She was very white. She rounded on Ron, Hermione, and Bill as though they had been as though they were being noisy, and hissed, Did you hear? He needs quiet. Headmaster, said Madame Pomfrey, staring at the great black dog that was serious. May I ask what? This dog will be remaining with Harry for a while, said Dumbledore simply. I assure you he is extremely well trained. Harry I will wait while you get into bed. Harry felt an inexpressible sense of gratitude to Dumbledore for asking the others not to question him. It wasn't as though he didn't want them there, but the thought of explaining it all over again, the idea of reliving it one more time was more than he could stand. I will be back soon to see you as soon as I've met with Fudge, Harry, said Dumbledore. I would like you to remain here tomorrow until I have spoken to the school. He left. This version of Dumbledore, Dumbledore in his... Dumbledore at his most magisterial, I suppose. Dumbledore at his most purposeful. Dumbledore at his most uncloaked. Not in terms of his power, but certainly in terms of his authority, is a thing to behold. His entire speech pattern has changed. He's now delivering these very short and clipped sentences, but he's doing so with all of the courtesy and consideration and thought and care that we would expect Dumbledore to express himself with. Molly, please listen to me for a moment. I love that he calls her Molly. I love the connection between Molly Weasley and Dumbledore that we get throughout the sequence. It is so strong and so gentle and so genuinely affectionate, I suppose, that, that yeah, I, I love that. We'll circle back around to that in just a, uh, just a few slides of time. Harry has been through a terrible ordeal tonight. He just had to relive it for me. What he needs now is sleep and peace and quiet. If, you would, if he would like you all to stay with him, you may do so, but I do not want you questioning him until he is ready to answer, and certainly not this evening. Two thoughts there. I do not want you questioning him until he is ready to answer, 
and certainly not this evening. Two distinct ideas here. Well, he can't answer you this evening because what he needs is rest and peace and quiet. But I also don't want you questioning him until he is ready to talk about this again, which echoes for me the beat between Harry and Dumbledore about Neville, right? We don't want to urge Neville to talk about what happened to his parents because he's not ready to do that. So Dumbledore asks Harry to respect Neville's privacy about this. If Neville hasn't chosen to speak of it, then please don't force this upon him. And so we're getting a similar beat here too. We get uh, not the reveal of Sirius, but the interaction of, of Dumbledore and the wonderful Madame Pomfrey in this sequence. Uh, this dog will be remaining for, uh, with Harry for a while, said Dumbledore simply. I assure you he's extremely well trained. Harry, I will wait while you get into bed. Very clipped, very purposeful, very, very forceful Dumbledore. And of course, I described this slide as being Harry's reunification with his family. And that is, for my money, exactly what we get. Mrs. Weasley, Bill, Ron, and Hermione. These are the people, well, Bill to a much lesser extent, I suppose, but Molly and Ron and Hermione, these are the people to whom Harry is closest in the world. He is being, well, reintegrated again, right? He is being returned to to his community, to his immediate community, not the larger community in the sense of the school, not the largest community in the sense of the wizarding world, but to his immediate, well, to his family. That's the word that we use to describe that immediate community. There it is. Yes. Good. Um... Let me see here. Yes, yes, uh, Gildarts Winters is, is pointing out. Forceful but gentle too. Yes, always gentle. Dumbledore is only when driven to the direst exigency, anything other than completely civil. He is, he is not a subversive kind of hero. He is not the kind of hero. He is not the, the exceptional kind of hero who stands in opposition to his community. I mean, he will be in the very near future, in fact, but only because his community has changed in the broadest possible sense. Dumbledore is, well, I guess if we consider Harry the classic kind of hero, if we consider Harry the kind of hero that we associate with, with ancient myth, with, with stories of Heracles and Perseus and Theseus, right? If we think of, of Harry in those terms, that he is exceptional and thus the rules do not apply to him, as we've discussed many times before, that is not the heroic model that fits Dumbledore best. And partly, particularly if you get into the expanded universe a little bit, that is because Dumbledore is so much older. Dumbledore has lived long enough to integrate properly with his society. Dumbledore is much more akin to a chivalric kind of hero. He embodies the values of his society, even when his society steps away from those values. When society changes, he, to borrow from Captain America, plants himself by uh, like a tree by the river of truth and says, no, you move. That's the Dumbledore that we get to know and love in the, uh, in the course of the series. So... This is our introduction to Harry's new scenario, his, his new uh, experience here as he is resting in the infirmary, but the battle is not over. Fudge came striding up the ward. Professors McGonagall and Snape were at his heels. Where's Dumbledore? Fudge demanded of Mrs. Weasley. He's not here, said Mrs. Weasley angry. This is a hospital wing, Minister. Don't you think you'd better to... But the door opened and Dumbledore came sweeping up the ward. What has happened? Said Dumbledore sharply, looking from Fudge to Professor McGonagall. Why are you disturbing these people? Minerva, I'm surprised at you. I ask you to stand guard over Barty Crouch. There's no need to stand guard over him anymore, Dumbledore, she, sh she shrieked. The Minister has seen to that... Harry had never seen Professor McGonagall lose control like this. There were angry blotches of colour in her cheeks and her hands were balled into fists. She was trembling with fury. Um, <clears throat> when we told Mr. F uh, <laughs> slipping into the wrong voice there. When we told Mr. Fudge that we had caught the Death Eater responsible for tonight's events, said Snape in a low voice, he seemed to feel his personal safety was in question. He insisted on summoning a Dementor to accompany him into the castle. He brought it up to the office where Barty Crouch... I told you he would not agree, Dumbledore! Uh, Professor McGonagall fumed. I told him you would never allow Dementors to set foot inside the castle, but... My dear woman! roared Fudge, who likewise looked angrier than Harry had ever seen him. As Minister of Magic, it is my decision whether I bring, wish to bring protection with me when interviewing a possibly dangerous... But Professor McGonagall's voice drowned Fudge's. The moment that... that thing entered the room, she screamed, pointing at Fudge, trembling all over. It swooped down on Crouch and... and... Harry felt a chill in his stomach as Professor McGonagall struggled to find words to describe what had happened. He did not need her to finish her sentence. He knew what the Dementor must have done. It had administered its fatal kiss to Barty Crouch. It had sucked his soul out through his mouth. He was worse than dead. By all accounts, he has no loss, blustered Fudge. It seems he is responsible for several deaths. Cornelius Fudge is a fascinating figure. Cornelius Fudge, in the course of the Harry Potter series to date, has always represented the Ministry really quite well. He has represented the Ministry with a kind of 
bumbling, officious, bureaucratic inadequacy, which nonetheless speaks to those structures of law and social convention, which govern the wizarding world as structures of law and social convention govern every community, every society, every culture. He has been not heroic, not even necessarily likable, but harmless and generally quite affable, I suppose. He has been an, uh, an object of, of antagonism for Harry. Uh, he has, he has uh, stood in Harry's way, of course, going all the way back to Chamber of Secrets, though Cornelius Fudge is not, particularly, uh, is not specifically aware of, of that uh, sequence of events. Um, but he has been, yes, bureaucratic, officious, but not dangerous. This is a turn for Fudge, and we're going to introduce another element to Fudge's character too in the course of the next few slides, which goes a long way toward unifying two separate themes of, of bigotry, of prejudice, of iniquity throughout the Wizarding World. We'll get to that in just a moment. But what is most important here is the Dementor's Kiss. A Dementor has been brought into Hogwarts expressly against Dumbledore's instructions. Minerva, uh, Minerva McGonagall is very clear about that, that Dumbledore would never have let a Dementor onto Hogwarts school grounds. But of course, the bureaucratic power of the Ministry supersedes the more specific authority of the Headmaster of Hogwarts school. And of course, the Dementor has fallen upon Barty Crouch and sucked out his soul. He is now worse than dead. And that, as, as Fudge blusters there at the end, is no great loss. It seems he has been responsible for several deaths. Several deaths, you say. Well, yeah, no, that's definitely worth the uh, eradication of one's soul via Dementor. The intrusion of Fudge into the sequence. It, it is very tempting to read this as a pretty standard kind of good guy versus bad guy opposition here at the heart of the Wizarding World. But the depth that we go to, the, the lengths that we go to, the complexity with which these arguments are articulated... They imbue the narrative with a certain solidity. There are things said in the sequence which we simply cannot take back. Let's bracket this first by talking a little bit about Harry and the way that Harry becomes all but transparent to the narrative at this point. Usually, the end of a Harry Potter story features Harry receiving exposition, usually from Dumbledore. Dumbledore will sit Harry down, usually in the infirmary, and explain to him all that has happened, or at least those parts of what has happened that Harry is equipped to understand at this point, maintaining some hooks for possible sequel novels in the future, of course. That same thing happens here, except... Harry is not the, the direct recipient of Dumbledore's attention or Dumbledore's exposition. Instead, we get this, this solidification, this codification of the change that we have already witnessed in the Wizarding World. We are not going to resolve this story at the end of this book. That is becoming increasingly clear as we accelerate toward the end of the novel. And now we are going to look at exactly why that is the case, exactly how this has changed. The parting of the ways is a powerful breaking point in our narrative. It would be the most powerful breaking point in our in our arc for Dumbledore throughout the series as a whole if we hadn't already hit that, that Dumbledore uncloaked moment, which is actually the most powerful moment. This is, this confrontation with Cornelius Fudge, I would argue, is a consequence of that moment of uncloaking far more than it is, it is a kind of a parallel moment of transformation for Dumbledore. I think that, that Dumbledore revealing himself in his fullest power and fullest magnitude leads directly to this confrontation and a less than diplomatic approach, I suppose, though still, of course, gentle and kind. So, Barty Crouch is gone, more than dead. Barty Crouch has been destroyed at this point, thanks to Cornelius Fudge. Let's, um, oh, let me see here as, as I catch up. Uh, oh, Gildarts Winters is saying, I thought for a while that Fudge was imperious to, to plant seeds of discord within the very office of wizardry. It's so tempting to think along those lines exactly, Gildarts. I see exactly where you're coming from there because, well, let's, talk about that kind of exceptionalism, right? The wizarding world is good, except for a few very bad wizards. You've got your Voldemort, you've got your Lucius Malfoy, you've got your, you know, uh, other characters who show up, you've got lesser evils, I suppose, like Gilderoy Lockhart, you've got, you know, we, there are bad wizards in the wizarding world, but the wizarding world is fundamentally good. What we are doing now is establishing within the body of Cornelius Fudge, who has already been representative of that wizarding world for, what, at this point, basically two and a half books, I suppose, for, for the majority of the Harry Potter series that we have had to date, he has represented singularly that wizarding world. We are 
tempted. We are almost led to the conclusion that something has manipulated him, that he has been imperious, or that he is being somehow overwhelmed by Voldemort into taking this action. That no, 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 Voldemort cast the imperious curse on him, which is why he took the Dementor into Hogwarts, which is why the Dementor killed Barty Crouch to kind of tie up loose ends. It all makes sense. But we're deliberately pushing back against that with everything that Cornelius Fudge says to Dumbledore in the course of this chapter, because we can't allow this idea that the wizarding world is fundamentally good but for a few bad wizards to persist. That is not the world that we are in. It's not the world that we've been in for some time, as I've said. The roots of this go back all the way to Azkaban, right? To, to Prisoner of Azkaban, the novel, rather than Azkaban, the physical place. Um, though also, obviously, the physical place. Um, the roots of this idea that the wizarding world is not just, that the wizarding world is not good, that the wizarding world is not progressive or fair or even really positive, that it is not healthy, We've been banging that drum for a while now, but this is the final turn in that story. This is the moment at which it becomes completely clear the extent to which that is true. Um, I'm, gosh, you guys are so chatty here in the, in the chat tonight. There's, there's so much. Okay, let's... Um yeah, Seastar saying, I, I didn't mind uh, Barty Crouch Jr.'s fate in its own right, just how it contributed to quashing the truth about Voldemort's return. Well, this is another question. This is something that, you know, glancing nervously at the clock, we are just not going to have sufficient time to talk about tonight. We will have the uh, opportunity to talk about this in a couple of weeks' time when we talk about the movie adaptation of Goblet of Fire, I suppose. But hey, you guys, is this just? Is this justice? I think it is not. By all accounts, he is no loss, blustered fudge. It seems he has been responsible for several deaths. Oh, okay, so several deaths means that you can eradicate the soul of an individual, not just kill him, but destroy him in a much more substantial and forceful way. The blustering of fudge there, the fact that fudge is already on the back foot, suggests to me that everyone present understands that this is not justice. And we're going to get another opportunity to talk about... Wow, a really personal and excessive kind of justice when we talk about Hermione and the conclusion of the Rita Skeeter subplot in just a few slides time. Let's keep pushing onward here. Fudge still had that strange smile on his face. Once again, he glanced at Harry before answering, You're well prepared to believe that Lord Voldemort has returned on the word, on the word of a lunatic murderer and a boy who... Well, Fudge shot Harry another look and Harry suddenly understood. You've been reading Rita Skeeter, Mr. Fudge, he said quietly. Ron, Hermione, Mrs. Weasley, and Bill all jumped. None of them had realized that Harry was awake. Fudge reddened slightly, but a defiant and obstinate look came over his face. And if I have, he said, looking at Dumbledore, if I have discovered that you've been keeping certain facts about this boy very quiet, a passer-mouth, eh, and having funny turns all over the place, I assume that you are referring to the pains Harry has been experiencing in his scar, said Dumbledore coolly. You admit that he's been having these pains then, said Fudge quickly. Headaches, nightmares, possibly hallucinations. Listen to me, Cornelius said Dumbledore, taking a step toward Fudge, and once again he seemed to radiate that indefinable sense of power that Harry had felt after Dumbledore had stunned young Crouch. Harry is as sane as you or I. That scar upon his forehead has not addled his brains. I believe it hurts him when Lord Voldemort is close by, or feeling particularly murderous. Fudge had taken half a step back from Dumbledore, but he looked no less stubborn. You'll forgive me, Dumbledore, but I've never heard of a cursed scar acting as an alarm bell before. Again, the influence of Rita Skeeter, less, I would argue, a genuine and authentic and, and original motivation for Cornelius Fudge here as it is a justification for Cornelius Fudge. Because when the, when the, the conclusion is called out by Harry here, oh, you've been reading Rita Skeeter, Mr. Fudge, he said, cool, he said quietly. And Fudge acknowledges that, but he doesn't back down from the substantial point. He is marshalling arguments, but he is not marshalling evidence. He doesn't need to uh, to get to that. I want to pull out this quote here from uh, from Marshall. Reading this as a kid, I automatically assumed that Harry would be believed and that the remainder of the book would be the Ministry and Hogwarts preparing to battle the Death Eaters. The fact that by the end of the book, the real term was the corrupt Ministry trying to deny news of Voldemort's return was a huge twist to my nine-year-old self. Yes, absolutely. This is, this is honestly why I have a great affection for Goblet of Fire. It is this. It is this right here. Mad-Eye Moody is pretty great as a character, it turns out, throughout much of the book. And there's stuff about the Triwizard Tournament that I really like. But what makes Goblet of Fire important is everything that happens after Harry, uh, after Harry and Cedric touch the Triwizard Cup and are teleported to, uh, to Little Hangleton. Um, the bleak... God, uh, 
almost nihilistic way that we handle the return of Voldemort and the refusal of the authorities to believe Harry's story, and not even necessarily Harry's story, right? They, Fudge here is seeking to discredit Harry in order to invalidate the story. But even if Harry had returned out of the Triwizard Tournament like a like a glorious hero, even if he had 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 come out with absolute evidence, even if his his reputation was unimpeachable, even if Rita Skeeter had never written those articles about him, Cornelius Fudge still wouldn't believe Harry. He would find other ways of explaining this away. There is a refusal at the heart of the Wizarding World to acknowledge that this dreadful turn of events has in fact come to pass. And that is about invested power. That is about the existent status quo. That is about the, the the facade that has been constructed and the story that has been told, the lie that has been told about the first Wizarding War. Why do we have this notion that the wizard, the Wizarding World is a fundamentally good and just place uh, with a few bad apples, with a few bad wizards, but really everything else is great, everything else is awesome? Why do we have that lie in the pages of Harry Potter? Because that is the lie that is told by the Ministry. Okay, let me be careful there. It is not just the lie that is told by the Ministry. This is not to suggest that the Ministry is sending out active propaganda in this regard. It is the lie told by the Wizarding World to and about itself. All communities, all cultures define themselves by their stories. They tell stories about themselves in order to understand their place in the world. And when we shift the focus of the tyranny of Voldemort away from all those people who voluntarily served him and all those people who fell to corruption and darkness in and around that, that tyranny, right? And not directly twisted by Voldemort, but twisted by the consequences of Voldemort or by the consequences of the rebellion against Voldemort. And all those people who allowed power to go to their heads, like Barty Crouch Sr., for example, right? Remember the conversation with Sirius Black back in the cave outside of Hogsmeade. Rather than allowing that complicated truth to stand, rather than investigating and interrogating their own fundamental nature, the Wizarding World has created a useful scapegoat. It's not even about the Death Eaters anymore. It used to be about the Death Eaters, right? In the days after the First Wizarding War, the, the Death Eaters were persecuted, and the Death Eaters were terrible, terrible people who committed terrible crimes, right? This is not to this is not to offer any kind of morally relativistic kind of uh, sense of, of, well, you know, from a certain point of view, Voldemort's just doing what he believes is right, and so is Lucius Malfoy, and no, no. They were terrible people who did terrible things. But the Wizarding World, rather than engaging with its own corruption and its own fallibility, with its own imperfection, has whitewashed history and planted all that is wrong with the Wizarding World at the feet of he who must not be named, right? That, oh, that is a very effective piece of, of revisionist history, I suppose. And it is a piece of revisionist history which is awfully, awfully applicable to the real world. Was awfully applicable when J.K. Rowling wrote this book, is awfully applicable today, and will probably be awfully applicable, in fact, for the rest of human history. I think that that this is something that human beings do innately. We tell stories that 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 keep us safe, that keep us comfortable, that preserve the status quo. We, broadly speaking, right, individual people, individuals can respond positively to change and to fluidity of circumstance and to revolution and turmoil, revolution and evolution. Individuals can respond very well to those things, but people as a whole do not respond well to those things. Society demands a certain constancy. It demands a certain preservation of an active status quo. And that, well, that is always going to push back against huge earth-shattering changes, as we've seen here with the return of, of Voldemort. Yeah. Okay, let's, um, let's look at the actual steps that we must take this ah, uh, this is this is damn close to being my favorite Dumbledore that we get in the entire book, but here we go. Voldemort has returned, Dumbledore repeated. If you accept that fact straight away, Fudge, and take the necessary measures, we may still be able to save the situation. The first and most essential step is to remove Azkaban from the control of the Dementors. Preposterous, shouted Fudge again. Remove the Dementors? I'd be kicked out of office for suggesting it. Half of us only feel safe in our beds at night because we know, we know the Dementors are standing guard at Azkaban. The rest of us sleep less soundly in our beds, Cornelius, knowing that you have put Lord Voldemort's most dangerous supporters in the care of creatures who will join him the instant he asks them, said Dumbledore. They will not remain loyal to you, Fudge. Voldemort can offer them much more scope for their powers and their pleasures than you can. With the Dementors behind him and his old supporters returned to him, you will be hard-pressed to stop him regaining the sort of power he had thirteen years ago. Fudge was opening and closing his mouth as though no words could express his outrage. The second step you must take, and at once, Dumbledore pressed on, is to send envoys to the giants. Envoys to the giants! Fudge, Fudge shrieked, finding his tongue again. What madness is this? 
Extend them the hand of friendship now, before it is too late, said Dumbledore, or Voldemort will persuade them as he did before, that he alone among wizards will give them their rights and their freedom. You, you cannot be serious, Fudge gasped, shaking his, shaking his head and retreating further from Dumbledore. If the magical community got wind that I had approached the giants, people hate them, Dumbledore, end of my career. You are blinded, said Dumbledore, his voice rising now, the aura of power around him palpable, his eyes blazing once more, by the love of the office you hold, Cornelius. You place too much importance, and you always have done, on the so-called purity of blood. You fail to recognize that it matters not what someone is uh, what someone is born, but what they grow to be. Your Dementor has just destroyed the last remaining member of a pure blood, blood family as old as any, and see what that man chose to make of his life. I tell you now, take the steps I have suggested, and you will be remembered in office or out as one of the bravest and greatest ministers of magic we have ever known. Fail to act." And history will remember you as the man who stepped aside and allowed Voldemort a second chance to destroy the world we have tried to rebuild. This is top-notch stuff. This is fantastic stuff. This is anchored in previous discussions. It's anchored in, of course, Voldemort's plan. Like, what is Voldemort going to do? Oh, he's going to have the Dementors release everyone in Azkaban. And then he's going to hang out with the Giants and he is going to raise a hell of a rebellion against the Wizarding World. He is going to, in fact, do everything that Dumbledore anticipates in this moment. And what is stopping Dumbledore? What is stopping Cornelius Fudge from taking action? Well, this is curious, isn't it? I mentioned earlier that we align here. We we integrate two different kinds of prejudice. And I'm not entirely sure how this works out. I went back and read the previous appearances of Cornelius Fudge in the prior books. And I'm not sure that his prejudice against impure blood wizards, you know, uh, muggle-born wizards and the like, I'm not sure that his prejudice is established in the books prior to this point with any kind of of, of great strength or, or great fortitude, great, great certitude at that point. But it works beautifully here. Look at what Dumbledore says. You are blinded, said Dumbledore, his voice rising now, the aura of power around him palpable, his eyes blazing once more. Again, Dumbledore uncloaked. You are blinded by the love of the office you hold, Cornelius. You place too much importance and you always have done on the so-called purity of blood. Well, okay. Those two things may be true, but they are still two things. Those are two different arguments that you are making now. We are very accustomed to the first argument. The first argument is the one that Fudge has been making, or the one that is being made around Fudge, I suppose, throughout this entire sequence. The second step you must take, and at once Dumbledore pressed on us to send envoys to the giants. Envoys to the giants, Fudge shrieked. What madness is this? Extend them the hand of French. You cannot be serious. If the magical community got wind that I had approached the giants, people hate them, Dumbledore. End of my career. Yes, yes. He is very concerned about his career. He's very concerned about the status quo. That is what Cornelius Fudge represents within the ministry, within the, the, the wizarding world, right? That is the, the kind of power dynamic that we see here. It is the preservation of the status quo. People would be appalled at the thought that things were going to change vis-a-vis the giants, let alone vis-a-vis the Dementors and Azkaban, right? We want the certainty of what we have. This is about the preservation of Cornelius Fudge's career, but Dumbledore takes a sidestep here when he accuses him also of being prejudiced against those wizards of somewhat less than pure blood, which is obviously a very problematic issue that we've we've discussed before in the context of Dear Mr. Potter and which I do not have time to get into right now. Um, Unifying these two agendas, I suppose, unifying these two desires, unifying these two preoccupations is actually extremely strong work by J.K. Rowling at this point. She is not casually throwing all of her villainous motivation into a a big cauldron, into a crucible, and just, you know, applying it to everyone who crosses Dumbledore's path at this point. This is much more powerful and much more purposeful than that. Of course, the status quo of the wizarding world is embodied in the oldest wizarding families. It is embodied in the pureblood families. Why are the pureblood wizards skeptical of muggle-born wizards? Well, because muggle-born wizards are always going to be a force for change. They are not going to grow up in the uh, in the traditional wizarding community, so they are going to be less invested in that status quo that we've discussed so freely this evening. They are going to bring evolution, if not revolution. That is one of the reasons that we are so skeptical of those of impure blood. But aligning these two motivations goes a long way toward finally deconstructing the Ministry of Magic as a force for good, or if not a force for good, I think honestly that ship has sailed. If you're paying close attention, I think that that ship has sailed by now. But if not a force for good, then at least a force of justice. At least, well, and that ship's kind of sailed too, if we're looking at the the pensive memories of, of Barty Crouch Sr., of course. 
if not a force of good, if not a force of justice, at least a force of, of conventionality, at least a force of, of lowercase c conservatism, right? At least it is trying to preserve the world. But it's not trying to preserve the world in an inclusive way. It is trying to preserve the world in an exclusive way. Cornelius Fudge, Fudge here, you know, metonymically representing all of the ministry and thereby all of the, the ordered and arrayed uh, conventional wizarding families and, and individuals and societies, right? He is representing the wizarding world at that moment, and this is what is wrong with the wizarding world. Of course, this entangles itself with the idea that Albus Dumbledore is a friend to muggles and a friend to mudbloods and a friend to other wizards who are seeking to, well, not seeking to even necessarily, right? Who are inevitably and necessarily changing the wizarding world simply by virtue of their presence. This is one of the great thematic arguments at the heart of, of Harry Potter, stasis versus change. This idea of, of ongoing revolution, this is something that is going to be much more important in the last three books in the series, starting with Order of the Phoenix, which we'll get to in just, uh, well, I was going to say a few weeks, but more than a few weeks time before we get to, uh, before we get to Order. I'm a little confused here by one minor detail. We've talked, obviously, a lot about Azkaban, and we've talked a lot about the Dementors and what they represent. I'm confused about a pivot that we get here at the end of Goblet of Fire, where it is asserted with increasing force and certainty that the Dementors are the most loyal servants, besides the Death Eaters, the most loyal servants of Voldemort. Because I'm somewhat confused about the mechanics of Azkaban in the days after the Wizarding War, right? Right after Voldemort fell the first time, Death Eaters were being locked up in Azkaban in the tender and gentle and loving care of the Dementors. The Dementors were already clearly in charge of Azkaban. Again, we've had some, some dubious and ambiguous references to human guards at Azkaban at some point in the past, but now increasingly, it's, no, Azkaban is, is held by the Dementors and that is it. Why were we trusting the Dementors? Why were we trusting the most faithful servants of Lord Voldemort right after the Wizarding War? Like, I could get 13 years later, you know, memories have faded, circumstances have changed, we needed, like, a certain pragmatic response to a, a difficult and a changing world, maybe we can make excuses in that regard, but I, I'm unsure about the role of the Dementors right after the Wizarding War. This is a bit of a retcon, by the way. I, I don't think that this was originally intended by J.K. Rowling when she introduced Azkaban, obviously, back in Chamber of Secrets. I don't think that this was uh, intended by J.K. Rowling when she introduced the Dementors in the context of, of Prisoner of Azkaban, but this is a natural evolution. Having introduced the Dementors, of course they side with Voldemort, and of course they side with Voldemort because um, they will not remain loyal to you, Fudge. Voldemort can offer them much more scope for their powers and their pleasures than you can. Oh, he's going to offer them freedom. That's it. He's, he's just going to allow them to do as they will. He's not going to keep them bound up in, in Azkaban or bound up in the service of the ministry as you do through mechanisms that we don't entirely understand and honestly never will at this point. Um, he's going to give them freedom. Likewise, he is going to go to the giants and is going to appeal to the giants by saying, no, 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 I am the only wizard who will give you your freedom. I am the only wizard who will tear down the structures that have kept you oppressed if only you will fight for me. And there's a kind of justice to that, right? There's a kind of, particularly as Dumbledore said, you know, send, communicate, send diplomats to the giants and start making friends with the giants right now. This oppression of the non-human magical races has to end and it has to end now. The giants are the biggest problem right now because the giants are the most, you know, dangerous military force, I suppose, or, or dangerous uh, physical force. But also, parenthetically, we really need to go and talk to the centaurs and we need to go and talk to the merfolk and we really need to go and talk to the goblins. And hey, if someone could like sit down with the house elf and just figure out that whole thing. Hermione, you're not doing anything right now, or indeed for the rest of this book, besides catching a bug on a windowsill, it's going to be fine. You just need to like go and sit down with the house elves and figure something out because our dominance of these other cultures is now going to come back to hurt us. Of course, that dominance was not established in the years since the first Wizarding War. It was presumably, that was a... a a source of power that Voldemort tapped during his first rise to power and is going to tap now again during his second rise to power. And Dumbledore here at the last, making a pitch to Cornelius Fudge, which is a very wise and gentle, if slightly... Well, no, I mean, it is manipulative, but I also think that it is honest. I do not think that Dumbledore is lying to Fudge in this last paragraph. I think that he means exactly what he says. He's also well aware that he is manipulating a man who is very concerned with his public image, right? 
um, I tell you now, take the steps I have suggested and you will be remembered in office or out as one of the bravest and greatest ministers of magic we have ever known. Fail to act and history will remember you as the man who stepped aside and allowed Voldemort a second chance to destroy the world we have tried to rebuild. Note those two options, right? You can either act against Voldemort or you can step aside. Those are the two things that you might do at this time. He doesn't say work with me or work with Voldemort. Those are your choices. He's not accusing Fudge of actively aligning himself with the returning Dark Lord at this point. He's not saying, no, well, obviously you're a proto Death Eater. You're a Death Eater in training. It's only a matter of time. So you either need to work with me and the forces of light or Voldemort and the forces of darkness, and that's it. No, we're getting something much more sophisticated here. All that it takes for evil to triumph, etc., 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 right? If you just stand by, if you do nothing, if you do not step up right now, that's all it's going to take for Voldemort to return to power. That's all it's going to take for Voldemort to have a second chance to destroy the world we have tried to rebuild. That tearing down of wizard society. Well, more on that, I guess, as we move forward through the rest of the books in the series. Yeah. I'm going to catch up with the chat here and, and again, glance, uh, glance nervously at the clock. Um, Wow, we're getting some really great thoughts here. If you guys don't have, uh, if you are not joining me here in the live chat, or if you are not keeping up with the live chat, you can, of course, always go back to the live chat. If you head on over to the Crowdcast page at crowdcast.io slash point north live, then you're able to go back through the entire Dear Mr. Potter series that we've produced over the course of, I don't know, when did we switch over to Crowdcast? Eight months ago, something like that. And you can read the uh, chat transcripts along with the live episodes. So if you're ever interested in catching up with the live discussions, you have the opportunity to go do that thing. That is pretty great. Um, okay. Um, um, uh, Jackie's saying, in JKR's defense, I always got the impression that the Dementors have become more and more restless over the years since the end of the First War, and so they definitely go over to Voldemort's side this time around. I, I, I like that, and I... I... <laughs> Again, right? I want to be generous, and I want to integrate this in my understanding of the Wizarding World, Jackie, and I completely see the point that you are making. I would like someone at some point to say that. I would like it so... What is asserted within the frame of the text is... Well, of course the Dementors are going to go over to Voldemort's side, right? By people who know what they are talking about, including Voldemort, the Dementors are just going to go over to his side immediately. Both Voldemort and Dumbledore understand that unequivocally. There is no question in Dumbledore's mind that that is going to happen. If there had been some kind of argument made about that, then we might be able to, to find a little more wiggle room there. But yeah, I can't, I can't dispute your interpretation, Jackie. Um, I, I wish that we'd had a little more certainty in, in, in that regard. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep on going here. Um, and to the taking of science, this is, uh, okay, this is the last slide of my first half. We're going to have to pick up the pace here. The only one against whom I intend to work, said Dumbledore, is Lord Voldemort. If you're against him, then we remain Cornelius on the same side. It seemed Fudge could think of no answer to this. He rocked backward and forward on his small feet for a moment and spun his bowler hat in his hands. Finally, he said with a hint of a plea in his voice, He can't be back, Dumbledore. He just can't be. Snape strode forward, past Dumbledore, pulling up the left sleeve of his robes as he went. He stuck out his forearm and showed it to Fudge, who recoiled. There, said Snape, harshly. There, the dark mark. It is not as clear as it was an hour or so ago when it burned black, but you can still see it. Every Death Eater had the sign burned into him by the Dark Lord. It was a means of distinguishing one another, and his means of summoning us to him. When he touched the mark of any Death Eater, we were to disapparate and apparate instantly at his side. This mark has been growing clearer all year. Karkaroff's, too. Why do you think Kakarov fled tonight? We both felt the mark burn. We both knew he had returned. Kakarov fears the Dark Lord's vengeance. He betrayed too many of his fellow Death Eaters to be sure of a welcome back into the fold. Fudge stepped back from Snape, too. He was shaking his head. He did not seem to have taken in a word Snape had said. He stared, apparently repelled by the ugly mark on Snape's arm, then looked up at Dumbledore and whispered, I don't know what you and your staff are playing at, Dumbledore, but I've heard enough. I have no more to add. I will be in touch with you tomorrow, Dumbledore, to discuss the running of this school. I must return to the Ministry. He had almost reached the door when he paused. He turned around, strode back down the dormitory, and stopped at Harry's bed. Your winnings, he said shortly, taking a large bag of gold out of his pocket and dropping it into Harry's bedside table. One thousand galleons. There should have been a presentation ceremony, but under the circumstances... He crammed his bowler hat onto his head and walked out of the room, slamming the door behind him. When I mentioned earlier that Cornelius Fudge is going to reject any evidence, that he is going to use any means of explanation at his command in order to justify his response to the return of Voldemort, that is, the lack of a response to the return of Voldemort, or the lack of acknowledgement of the return of Voldemort, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Snape comes forward, shows him the dark mark. He knows what the dark mark is. He knows what it represents, even if he doesn't know the exact mechanism. But Snape conveniently outlines the exact mechanism for him, and he still refuses it. He still cannot engage with it. Fudge 
Fudge stepped back from Snape too. He was shaking his head. He did not seem to have taken in a word Snape had said. He stared, apparently repelled by the ugly mark on Snape's arm, then looked up at Dumbledore and whispered, so he's seeing the mark, he comprehends the mark, he understands the mark, but he cannot hear Snape in this moment. He literally cannot internalize these words. He cannot accept the fact that he has returned. He can't be back, Dumbledore. He just can't be. These are the words that, that illustrate the magnitude of Cornelius Fudge's denial at this point. He cannot engage with a world in which Voldemort is back. That is the problem now that opposes Dumbledore, right? And you'll see there too, the, the repetition of Dumbledore's name as we get the attributed dialogue to Fudge in that beat. I don't know what you and your staff are playing at, Dumbledore, but I've heard enough. I have no more to add. I will be in touch with you tomorrow, Dumbledore, to discuss the running of this school. I must return to the ministry. He is focusing himself on Dumbledore entirely there because presumably Snape is still standing there, like not two feet from him with his sleeve rolled up, showing him the dark mark. Ah, ah, you see this? Ooh, symbol of Voldemort, symbol of Voldemort. Voldemort's back, you guys. He's in such denial that he is fixated on Dumbledore at this moment. I also just love, again, I have nothing like the time that I would need to do this properly or carefully enough, but I love the way that Dumbledore modulates his terms of address. I love the way that he switches back and forth between calling him Fudge and calling him Cornelius, the way that he is offering rhetorical carrots and rhetorical, uh, rhetorical sticks, I suppose, right? When he is trying to convince and lure Cornelius Fudge to the side of light, to the side of good, he calls him Cornelius. It's a personal, intimate mode of address. When he is trying to intimidate him, he calls him Fudge, that much more propulsive monosyllabic, uh, monosyllabic word there. It's, it's really, really powerful. Yeah. Good. Uh, cool. That's what you're saying. I wanted uh, Dumbles to challenge Fudge to a duel. Wow. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, <laughs> that would have been pretty amazing. Uh, Rohit says, Snape's monologue here makes me realize he must have gone straight to Dumbledore when he felt the mark burn, exactly the moment Voldemort touched, wor touched Wormtail's mark. So Dumbledore was aware for like 30 to 45 minutes before Harry got back that Voldemort had returned. Elucidate some of what it must have happened uh, must have happened in the stands during that time. That's just terrifying. That's really good, actually. That's that's quite lovely. I uh, yeah, I'm not sure that I'd ever put that together. You're right. The timeline is a is a little soft. It may have taken him 15 minutes to get to Dumbledore, or you know what I, I don't know exactly what the mechanism is. But yes, that that's a really that's a really good point. That that sudden burn and the the incontrovertible evidence of of Voldemort's return there being the manifestation, the fullest manifestation of the dark mark on Snape's arm. That's that's powerful. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. Good pull. Good pull. All right. Um, excellent. Let's keep going here then. And uh, well, that's enough fudge for one evening. I think instead, let's switch to the reveal of one serious Black and the response of Severus Snape. Snape had not yelled or jumped backward, but the look on his face was one of mingled fury and horror. Him, he snarled, snarled, staring at Sirius, whose face showed equal dislike. What is he doing here? He is here at my invitation, said Dumbledore, looking between them. As are you, Severus. I trust you both. It is time for you to lay aside your old differences and trust each other. Harry thought Dumbledore was asking for a near miracle. Sirius and Snape were eyeing each other with the utmost loathing. I will settle in the short term, said Dumbledore, with a bite of impatience in his voice, for a lack of open hostility. You will shake hands. You are on the same side now. Time is short, and unless the few of us who know the truth do not stand united, there is no hope for any of us. Very slowly but still glaring at each other as though they wished the other nothing but ill, Sirius and Snape moved toward each other and shook hands. They let go extremely quickly. That will do to be going on with, said Dumbledore, stepping between them once more. Now, I have work for each of you. Fudge's attitude, though not unexpected, changes everything. Sirius, I need you to set off at once. You are to alert Remus Lupin, Arabella Fig, Mundungus Fletcher, the old crowd. Lie low at Lupin's for a while. I will contact you there. But, said Harry, he wanted Sirius to stay. He did not want to have to say goodbye again so quickly. You'll see me very soon, Harry, said Sirius, turning to him. I promise you. But I must do what I can. You understand, don't you? Yeah, said Harry. Yeah, of course I do. A moment of partial and begrudging reconciliation between Severus Snape and Sirius Black. This story, you guys, is not entirely over. But I love the, the force of Dumbledore's will here. He has moved on from being blunt, I suppose, from being less 
protective and sensitive in the manifestation of his power, in the exercise of his power and his authority, to being completely blunt and brutal. I will settle in the short term, said Dumbledore, with a bite of impatience in his voice, for a lack of open hostility. You will shake hands. You are on the same side now. Time is short, and unless the few of us who know the truth do not stand united, there is no hope for any of us. He is commanding the loyalty of both of these men, who very separately, like as separately as two men could possibly be, both owe a certain loyalty and a certain fealty and have a certain trust in Dumbledore. This is a great exercise of his power. And of course, bringing Sirius and, and uh, Severus together here, well, yeah, this is proof of Dumbledore's authority and also proof of the severity of these circumstances. Things must be bad indeed if we can force these two to get along. We're not done yet, though. Um, Oh, I should mention here, um, you are to alert Remus Lupin, of course, beloved of this parish, we all know Remus Lupin, Arabella Fig. Arabella Fig is introduced all the way back at the very beginning of Philosopher's Stone. Arabella Fig, as we'll find out in order, is a neighbor of the Dursleys who babysits Harry from time to time. She is mentioned right there at the beginning of Philosopher's Stone and not mentioned again until this moment. This is Mrs. Fig, who lives on the uh, the next street over from Privet Drive. Um, Mundungus Fletcher has also been mentioned previously. He is mentioned in uh, Chamber of Secrets. He is just all that we know about him is that he tried to hex Arthur Weasley. That's all, literally all that we know about him at this point. He too will show up later. But it's always great to see J.K.R. mining her own backstory here. And okay, is Fig a conscious inclusion at the beginning of Philosopher's Stone? We have no way of knowing. You guys, we have no way of knowing whether or not this was planned from the beginning, whether whether Arabella Fig was a, a conscious addition to the plot at that point, or whether she was just a part of the expanded Dursley-verse, I suppose. We have no way of knowing how much effort and energy J.K.R. put into that right at the beginning of, of the Harry Potter series, but it plays beautifully. There was no inconsistency here for me at all. I, I quite like what we get of Arabella Fig in, in the next book, uh, and arguably the same with Mundungus Fletcher, though, I suppose. That's just a much more a much more classically J.K.R. kind of name, so we've got a little more to, uh, to, to conjure with there, as we can say. Um, yeah, if not, says uh, says Angela, if it, if it wasn't implied, then it is a seamless retcon. Yeah, no, an absolutely seamless retcon. It, it's one of the best examples of her. I was going to say plundering. Plundering sounds a little riotous and anarchic and ill-disciplined, I suppose. It's, it's a perfect example of her mining her own backstory and her own evolving secondary creation here, I suppose, right? Her secondary world, her, her fictional realm. I, I quite like the way that she does that with increasing power and certainty as we move forward. This is not the only circumstance in which she will do exactly this thing in, in the course of Goblet of Fire. Of course, we've already name-checked some uh, some um, Death Eaters who have been present in the books previously and who will be present in the books in the future, right? We know about the Little Strangers already, even though we have yet to meet them. It's 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 pretty good, actually. Yeah, yeah. Seastar says, I have a friend who has a daughter named Arabella. I love Arabella. That's a very good, it's a very good name. I like that a great deal. So, so elegant. Yeah, yeah. Good, okay. Let's get to our last slide here in, uh, in chapter 36 and then onward into chapter 37, the beginning. You've got to take the rest of your potion, Harry, Mrs. Weasley said at last. Her hand nudged the sack of gold in his bedside cabinet as she reached for the bottle and the goblet. You have a good long sleep. Try and think about something else for a while. Think about what you're going to buy with your winnings. I don't want that gold, said Harry in an expressionless voice. You have it. Anyone can have it. I shouldn't have won it. It should have been Cedric's. The thing against which he had been fighting on and off ever since he had come out of the maze was threatening to overpower him. He could feel a burning, prickling feeling in the inner corners of his eyes. He blinked and stared up at the ceiling. It wasn't your fault, Harry, Mrs. Weasley whispered. I told him to take the cup with me, said Harry. Now the burning feeling was in his throat, too. He wished Ron would look away. Mrs. Weasley set the potion down in the bedside cabinet, bent down and put her arms around Harry. He had no memory of ever being hugged like this, as though by a mother. The full weight of everything he had seen that night seemed to fall in upon him as Mrs. Weasley held him to her. His mother's face, his father's voice, the sight of Cedric, dead on the ground, all started spinning in his head until he could hardly bear it, until he was screwing up his face against the howl of misery fighting to get out of him. There was a loud slamming noise, and Mrs. Weasley and Harry broke apart. Hermione was standing by the window. She was holding something tight in her hand. Sorry, she whispered. Your potion, Harry, said Mrs. Weasley, quickly wiping her eyes on the back of her hand. Harry drank it in one gulp. The effect was instantaneous. Heavy, irresistible waves of dreamless sleep broke over him. He fell back onto his pillows and thought no more. If you're going to make a list of Molly Weasley's best moments, 
and you should, you should do that thing because God knows the <laughs> night is dark and full of monsters. So <laughs> why wouldn't you do that thing? Why wouldn't you bring the light of Molly Weasley into your life by compiling a list of her greatest moments? And if you're going to do that thing, this has to be very near the top. I love, gosh, just everything about it. The, the, the simplicity, like the maternal simplicity of you have a good long sleep. Try and think about something else for a while. Think about what you're going to buy with your winnings. She's Mrs. Weasley. She knows her kids. That would absolutely be enough to, to work on basically any one of her kids, in fact. Like, the lure of sudden and unexpected wealth, yeah, it's not important in any kind of absolute sense. It's not going to change your life in any kind of significant way, but it is a pleasant daydream. It is, crucially, a pleasant distraction. But all that Harry has endured is now threatening to break out within him. I th I'll have to just look at this, I suppose, very briefly, but he had no memory of ever being hugged like this as though by a mother. Yeah, very much as though by a mother, in fact. One might almost say, by his mother. I don't think that the quality of being Harry's mother is a limited thing. I don't think that at this point Lily Evans is the only one who, who gets to claim that. I think that Molly Weasley, by dint of care and by dint of love, by dint of presence, if nothing else, gets a measure of that right now. Obviously, Harry can't think of that because he is also so occupied with the face of his mother, with the voice of his father, with the, the vision of Cedric's body in this moment. He can't completely integrate his response to Molly, but it is a maternal moment, and it's so beautiful. It all started spinning in his head until he could hardly bear it, until he was screwing up his face against the howl of misery, fighting to get out of him. There was a loud slamming noise, and Mrs. Weasley and Harry broke apart. Hermione was standing by the window. She was holding something tight in her hand. Hey, we'll visit that subplot again in uh, nine days. Nine days, in fact, it is going to take Hermione to uh, to reveal the detail of this particular subplot. Nine days, which is a lot when you think about what she is going to do between here and there and what she is going to keep in a little glass jar between here and there. Nine days, you guys. I'm kind of resentful toward Hermione at this moment. I'm kind of resentful toward the intrusion of a very minor subplot at this point in the book on a moment of what would be, should be, enormous cathartic release for Harry. Dumbledore has just pointed this out, right? I can, I can give you an enchanted sleep, I can make it so that you don't have to think about this right now, but if you defer this pain, it is going to be so much worse on the other side. And what is happening right now? Thanks to Hermione's intrusion, a, a well-intentioned intrusion, absolutely, but an intrusion nonetheless, Harry's pain is deferred. Harry, instead of expressing that howl of anguish, that howl of grief, that, that raging storm of emotion within him, instead drinks the draught and passes out immediately into a dreamless sleep. That's it. There is a pain now within Harry that is going to come out at some point. And yeah, we'll talk about how exactly that manifests, possibly, ambiguously, by implication, at the beginning of Order of the Phoenix, of course, when we get there. Yeah, yeah. Jackie's saying, I don't know how people become whole again after something like this. You know, it's, it's, human beings are spectacularly, irrationally, beautifully, defiantly resilient. There is not a virtue, I think, in that resilience, or, or that is to say that the absence of that resilience is not the absence of virtue. But we are innately Partly because of that narrativization that I was talking about earlier, partly because of our ability to understand through stories and through retelling and through the re-experiencing of memory, our own experience, our own life stories, as it were, you know, we are all engaged in a kind of reflexive autobiographical determinism, right? We are all telling ourselves the story of our lives in order to move forward with our lives, in order to, to understand all that we have experienced and to, to integrate all that we have failed to experience and to, to live with disappointment and to live with tragedy and to live with grief. Human beings are beautifully resilient because human beings are irrationally capable of hope. We are irrationally capable of hope in the face of despair, and we are irrationally capable of taking action even when the odds seem overwhelming. Even when hearts are broken, they will mend. Human beings are pretty magnificent, I suppose. And this is obviously reflective of my perspective on human beings and my my hope for the goodness and decency of humanity, which, though it is assaulted, remains undimmed, you guys, in 2018. But 
It's also reflective of a kind of strong and, and purposeful humanism that we get from JKR. That's actually a really nice bit of foreshadowing for where we're going to go with the series, particularly, I would argue, in Order of the Phoenix, even more so than in Deathly Hallows. We're going to see integration and disintegration through the arc of, of the rest of the Harry Potter series. And of course, I'm setting aside Half-Blood Prince there because Half-Blood Prince is kind of an animal of a different sort i suppose half blood prince is 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 a different uh is a different type of story <laughs> okay i can't talk too much about half blood prince at this point half blood prince does not do what order of the phoenix does and what deathly hallows does i would argue that much if no more than that for right now i do think there's a humanist streak at the heart of of jkr i think that we can uh, the heart of jkr's work i think that we can find that in her commentaries and her 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 explorations of community and of friendship and of love and of hope. I think that we can find it in her discussions of despair and of fear and, you know, the Dementors and Expecto Patronum, right? One of the most important thematic oppositions right at the heart of, of this entire story. What do we do in the face of tyranny? What do we do in the face of of futility, of outright futility? What do we do in the face of danger and death? Well, we find hope and we act upon that hope. Human beings are weirdly good at it, and it enkindles within me. The recognition of that within our fiction enkindles within me a faith in that in our real life, I suppose. Yeah. All right. Let's um, let's keep going. We, we, we must get into chapter 37. I have, gosh, a little over half an hour. Okay, we're going to move quickly here. Let's do this thing. Because, honestly, the story now is finished. We could conclude the story at the end of chapter 36. And there would be some unresolved subplots. There would be a few nice moments that we wouldn't get to take off our list of things that we want from a Harry Potter book. But honestly, 37 is all denouement. We are now just coming down. We're resolving. We're offering a little extra, a little extra exposition. Some of it is quite lovely. And we're obviously going to have to talk a little about Cedric Diggory, but we'll do what we can here. Harry returned to Gryffindor Tower the following evening. From what Hermione and Ron told him, Dumbledore had spoken to the school that morning at breakfast. He had merely requested that they leave Harry alone, that nobody ask him any questions or badger him to tell the story of what had happened in the maze. Most people he noticed were skirting him in the corridors, avoiding his eyes. Some whispered behind their hands as he passed. He guessed that many of them had believed Rita Skeeter's article about how disturbed and possibly dangerous he was. Perhaps they were formulating their own theories about how Cedric had died. He found he didn't care very much. He liked it best when he was with Ron and Hermione and they were talking about other things or else letting him sit in silence while they played chess. He felt as though all three of them had reached an understanding they didn't need to put into words, that each was waiting for some sign, some word of what was going on outside Hogwarts, and that it was useless to speculate about what might be coming until they knew anything for certain. The only time they touched upon the subject was when Ron told Harry about a meeting Mrs. Weasley had had with Dumbledore before going home. She went to ask him if you could come straight to us this summer, he said, but he wants you to go back to the Dursleys, at least at first. Why? said Harry. She said Dumbledore's got his reasons, said Ron, shaking his head darkly. I suppose we've got to trust him, haven't we? Molly's still trying to take care of Harry, even in this moment. It's it's pretty great. Um, oh, Becca's quoting uh, <laughs> that, that line that I'd stumbled into a couple of uh, podcast episodes ago. I guess it was uh, there and back again, right? That was uh, in there and back again. Defiance is weaponized hope. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aomer, on the fields of, of the Pelennor for, for bringing that to my mind. Yeah, no, I'm... I'm Pretty proud of that. From time to time, inadvertently, in the course of these live sessions, I will say something that I think about afterward and go, huh, that was pretty good, actually. That, that was a thing worth saying, at least, which is really all that I aspire to here in these live sessions, is to say things worth saying, and sometimes to commentate on the importance of saying things worth saying, I suppose. So this is Harry's reintegration to his actual quotidian existence here, right? He's back in the body of Hogwarts. He is back in the bosom of the student body, even though that bosom is kind of avoiding him right now and not really wanting to connect with him and maybe believing Rita Skeeter's stories and, and speculating about the death of Cedric Diggory, but... He is still numbed. You'll note that, that he doesn't care very much. He liked it best when he was with Ron and Hermione and they were talking about other things or letting him sit in silence while they play chess. You notice he isn't talking. They are talking about other things. They are playing chess. He is just present. He is in a suspended state after this vile shock. He is still healing, but he hasn't yet processed all of that pain. He is still disconnected from himself. We learn that because there isn't a uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher right now, that uh, they have those lessons free, so they go to visit Hagrid, so we can clear up a little bit of the Hagrid plot, and we get some good, good Hagrid in this scene. Knew we were going to come back, said Hagrid, and Harry, Ron, and Hermione looked up at him, shocked. Known it for years, Harry. Knew he was out there biding his time. It had to happen. Well, now it has, and we'll just have to get on with it. We'll fight. Might be able to stop him before he gets a good hold. That's Dumbledore's plan, anyway. Great man, Dumbledore. As long as we got him, I'm not too worried. Hagrid raised his bushy eyebrows at the disbelieving expressions on their faces. 
No good sitting worrying about it, he said. What's well, coming will come, and we'll meet it when it does. Dumbledore told me what you did, Harry. Hagrid's chest swelled as he looked at Harry. You did as much as your father would have done, and I can give you no higher praise than that. Harry smiled back at him. It was the first time he'd smiled in days. What's Dumbledore asked you to do, Hagrid? He asked. He sent Professor McGonagall to ask you and Madame Maxime to meet him that night. Got a little job for me over the summer, said Hagrid. Secret, though. I'm not supposed to talk about it. No, not even a you lot. Olympi, Madame Maxime, are you? She might be coming with me. I think she will. I think I got her persuaded. It has to do with Voldemort. Hagrid flinched at the sound of the name. Might be, he said evasively. Now, who'd like to come and visit the last scrute with me? I was joking, joking, he added hastily, seeing the looks on their faces. Great man, Dumbledore. As long as we've got him, I'm not too worried. What's coming will come, and we'll meet it when it does. Hagrid too infrequently is allowed these moments of thematic authority, I suppose, thematic definition. But when they come, they are always enormously powerful. His faith in Dumbledore, his unshakable faith in Dumbledore, his respect for Harry. Uh, this, you, you did as much as your father would have done, and I can give you no higher praise than that. That's a moment of huge recognition, which Harry clearly understands. Harry smiled back at him. It was the first time he'd smiled in days. And we might, of course, freely speculate about what Dumbledore and Madame Maxime are going to get up to over the long summer holiday We'll circle back around to Hagrid's words right at the end of tonight's reading. It's it's just so lovely. Middle Mara saying Hagrid is like a warm hug or a heavy blanket, just so comfortable when you need to hide under it. I like that very much. Recyclops has asked, uh, have we asked this question? What the hell is going on with the biology of Scroots? Magic. Clear, clearly, clearly magic is happening here. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I'm not even sure that I have like a very clear sense of the life cycle or ecology or or anything about the scroots they're just yeah just incredibly dangerous things that explode I, i'm reminded of the dragons in the uh, terry pratchett discworld novels the the small swamp dragons who tend to explode when they get overexcited yeah yeah good becca saying the first real joy after a tragedy is huge and i'm so glad they gave that to hagrid it is really important i think that we get that it's it's just lovely yeah dumbledore is a great winner of loyalty observes jackie i completely agree yeah yeah Good. Uh, and Nikki's uh, jumping ahead right to the very end. What's well, coming will come and we'll meet it when it does. Doesn't that line get repeated at the end of one of the books? It gets repeated, in fact, at the end of this book. Yes, uh, we're going to circle back around to that in what is for me uh, maybe my favorite bit of, of J.K.R.'s writing in this entire book. Like Just in terms of the raw prose, the very end of this book is, is very good and we must push on, otherwise we're never going to get to it. Let's get to the... Um, to the leaving feast where again we just take off a bunch of uh, a bunch of points of exposition here so that we can round out our subplots it was with a heavy heart that harry packed his trunk up in the dormitory the night before his return to privet drive he was dreading the leaving feast which was usually a cause for celebration when the winner of the interhouse championship would be announced he had avoided being in the great hall when it was full ever since he had left the hospital wing preferring to eat when it was nearly empty to avoid the stares of his fellow students when he ron and hermione entered the hall they saw at once that the usual decorations were missing the Great Hall was normally decorated with the winning house's colors for the leaving feast. Tonight, however, there were black drapes on the wall behind the teacher's table. Harry knew instantly that they were there as a mark of respect to Cedric. The real Mad-Eye Moody was at the staff table now, his wooden leg and his magical eye back in place. He was extremely twitchy, jumping every time someone spoke to him. Harry couldn't blame him. Moody's fear of attack was bound to have been increased by his ten-month imprisonment in his own trunk. Professor Karkarov's chair was empty. Harry wondered as he sat down with the other Gryffindors where Karkarov was now and whether Voldemort had caught up with him. Madame Maxime was still there. She was sitting next to Hagrid. They were talking quietly together. Further along the table, sitting next to Professor McGonagall, was Snape. His eyes lingered on Harry for a moment as Harry looked at him. His expression was difficult to read. He looked as sour and unpleasant as ever. Harry continued to watch him long after Snape had looked away. What was it that Snape had done on Dumbledore's orders the night that Voldemort had returned? And why? Why? Was Dumbledore so convinced that Snape was truly on their side? He had been their spy, Dumbledore had said so in the pensive. Snape had turned spy against Voldemort at great personal risk. Was that the job he had taken up again? Had he made contact with the Death Eaters, perhaps? Pretended that he had never really gone over to Dumbledore? That he had been like Voldemort himself, biding his time? Harry's musings were ended by Professor Dumbledore, who stood up at the staff table. The great hall, which in any case had been less noisy than it usually was at the, le at the leaving feast, became very quiet. The end, said Dumbledore, looking around at them all of another year. So 
just catching up with some of our outstanding characters here. Karkarov is gone. The whole school is honoring Diggory. We don't give a damn about the House Cup by this point in the Harry Potter series, which makes a lot of sense. Madame Maxine is still present. We're drawing that connection again between McGonagall and Snape, a kind of, of balance between McGonagall and Snape, which does nothing to diminish Minerva McGonagall and everything to elevate Severus Snape. Even that moment of connection, Harry being unsure about what Snape thinks of him about what passes between them as they lock eyes they're continuing to stare at him after snape looks away and then speculating about snape's role in the ongoing rebellion rebellions are built on hope an ongoing rebellion against uh the the coming of lord voldemort biding his time as harry speculates here and then dumbledore moving into his greatest rhetorical mode the end of another year which of course in a chapter entitled the beginning gives us a, a beautiful duality here Let's move into our thoughts on Diggory. There is much that I would like to say to you all tonight, said Dumbledore, but I must first acknowledge the loss of a very fine person who should be sitting here. He gestured toward the Hufflepuffs, enjoying our feast with us. I would like you all, please, to stand and raise your glasses to Cedric Diggory. They did it, all of them. The benches scraped as everyone in the hall stood and raised their goblets and echoed in one loud, low, rumbling voice, Cedric Diggory. Harry caught a glimpse of Cho through the crowd. There were tears pouring silently down, his, down her face. He looked down at the table and they all sat down again. Cedric was a person who exemplified many of the qualities that distinguished Hufflepuff House, Dumbledore continued. He was a good and loyal friend, a hard worker. He valued fair play. His death has affected you all, whether you knew him well or not. I think you have the right, therefore, to know exactly how it came about. Harry raised his head and stared at Dumbledore. Cedric Diggory was murdered by Lord Voldemort. A panicked whisper swept the Great Hall. People were staring at Dumbledore in disbelief, in horror. He looked perfectly calm as he watched them mutter themselves into silence. The Ministry of Magic, Dumbledore continued, does not wish me to tell you this. It is possible that some of your parents will be horrified that I have done so, either because they will not believe that Lord Voldemort has returned, or because they think I should not tell you so young as you are. It is my belief, however, that the truth is generally preferable to lies, and that any attempt to pretend that Cedric died as the result of an accident, or some sort of blunder on his own, is an insult to his memory. The decency with which Dumbledore behaves here, the honesty, the civility, the greatness with which Dumbledore behaves in this part of the book is absolutely inspiring. And I am... Completely inclined. I have seen some of those, uh, some of those internet articles. Hey, was Dumbledore evil like the whole time? Was Dumbledore secretly like a terrible headmaster? Was he manipulating the student body of Hogwarts to pursue his own personal vendetta against he who must not be named? I I've read those articles too, you guys. I've also read all the articles about Obi Wan Kenobi being evil and so on and so forth because the internet loves nothing more than writing three thousand words tearing down a, a hero or adding complexity to a character who cannot necessarily sustain that level of complexity. I buy Dumbledore. Uh, words here. I, I believe him. Absolutely. The two reasons that he gives. The Ministry of Magic does not wish me to tell you this. It is possible that some of your parents will be horrified that I have done so, either because they do not believe that Lord Voldemort has returned, or because they think I should not tell you young as you are. So there are two reasons that your parents might be upset. Your parents... Okay, let's kind of branch out our, our branching diagram here. Okay, I am going to tell you this. Your parents may be upset. If they are upset, they may be upset because the ministry doesn't want you to know, because they themselves don't want to believe that Voldemort has returned, because they want to preserve the status quo, so on and so forth, or because they believe that Lord Voldemort has returned, but they don't want you to know that as young as you are. I, however, have two reasons for telling you this piece of information. It is my belief, however, that the truth is generally preferable to lies, and that any attempt to pretend that Cedric died as the result of an accident or some sort of blunder of his own is an insult to his memory. The truth is generally preferable to lies. By implication, I do not believe that you are too young to handle this information. I do not believe that you ought to be protected from a world that has just become so much more terrifying, that you are going to be caught up in this whether you like it or not, and so you deserve to know. And God, just imagine how the first years are feeling, right? It's something for Harry to be going through this at the end of his fourth year at Hogwarts. Just imagine how those, those first years are, uh, are feeling. Just imagine how the creevies are feeling, right? So, uh... Two arguments here. The first, the truth is preferable to lies. Generally preferable, which is a nice bit of Dumbledorean equivocation that I quite appreciate there. Also, though, and I, I read this to be a separate point, that any attempt to pretend that Cedric died as the result of an accident or some sort of blunder on his own is an insult to his memory. 
Cedric did not die by accident. He did not screw up during the third task and die as a consequence of, of some stupidity or some some reckless action, right? He certainly wasn't hurt by Harry, parenthetically. We'll get to him in just a moment. That would be an insult to his memory. It is important for you to understand that Cedric Diggory, as great as he was, Cedric was a person who exemplified many of the qualities that distinguish Hufflepuff House. He was a good and loyal friend, a hard worker. He valued fair play. This is... He was a great student at Hogwarts. He was good and he was respected and he was important and it is important to recognize that he didn't die because of some misadventure he died because of the action of the greatest dark wizard the world has ever known it is important to understand that even in his death cedric diggory was great and part of a a larger story there this raising of a glass um never fails to, to just get my own kind of uh, eyelids prickling here as I read this. Uh, I would like you all please to stand and raise your glasses to Cedric Diggory. They stood, they raised their goblets and echoed in one loud, low, rumbling voice, Cedric Diggory. It's a beautiful and powerful uh, and important moment there too, yeah. Nikki saying, um, um, uh, Dumbledore places the safety of his students before his position. It doesn't matter how many parents get enraged, how many threats he receives from the ministry, or that he could be ostracized and jobless. He is a good man. Right. As he said earlier, not a day has gone by when he hasn't received owls from people complaining how he runs this school. And it has never changed his approach one whit. The only time that his approach to running Hogwarts has been superseded at all is because of Harry and his, his reluctant allowing of Dementors to be stationed on the Hogwarts school grounds back in Prisoner of Azkaban. Apart from that, as far as we know, he has bowed to no one in his administration of this school. He is in charge, the, the, the headmasters. Yeah, yeah. Um, Angela is saying, oh, Colin and Dennis, the Creevies. Yeah, I pictured them and Alistair said first years too, even though they're older now. Yes, no, I know. I always think of them as perennial first years. I think that's that's pretty much where I am too, Angela. Yes, just thinking of that response pretty bad. What is Neville feeling right now? Oh, that's something that I can't even think about, right? I'm, I'm oh, I don't know. I'm so conflicted. I want Neville here at the end of the book. I also don't want Neville here at the end of the book because it's going to be heartbreaking. I, I don't want the, to picture Neville's little ashen face as he's considering what is happening now. That would be, yeah, just, just too much to think about. Wow. Okay, let's... Um Let's move on. We've got one more slide here of uh, of Dumbledore, and then we really are going to get uh, to picking things up. When everyone had once again resumed their seats, Dumbledore continued, The Triwizard Tournament's aim was to further and promote magical understanding. In the light of what has happened, of Lord Voldemort's return, such ties are more important than ever before. Dumbledore looked from Madame Maxime and Hagrid to Fleur Delacour and her fellow Beaubaton students, to Victor Crum and the Durmstrangs at the Slytherin table. Crumb, Harry saw, looked wary, almost frightened, as though he expected Dumbledore to say something harsh. Every guest in this hall, said Dumbledore, and his eyes lingered upon the Durmstrang students, will be welcomed back here at any time should they wish to come. I say to you all once again, in the light of Lord Voldemort's return, we are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. Lord Voldemort's gift for spreading discord and enmity is very great. We can fight it only by showing an equally strong bond of friendship and trust. Differences of habit and language are nothing at all if our aims are identical and our hearts are open. It is my belief, and never have I so hoped that I am mistaken, that we are all facing dark and difficult times. Some of you in this hall have already suffered directly at the hands of Lord Voldemort. Many of your families have been torn asunder. A week ago a student was taken from our midst. Remember, Cedric. Remember if the time should come when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy. Remember what happened to a boy who was good and kind and brave because he strayed across the path of Lord Voldemort. Remember Cedric Diggory. The Triwizard Tournament's aim was to further and promote magical understanding. I mean, kind of. Kind of. That was partly the stated intent. I mean, kind of intermural understanding, like closer ties across the wizarding world, yes, magical understanding always reads to me a little oddly there, because we're not trying to better understand magic through the Triwizard Tournament, we're trying to better understand each other. We're trying to draw these bonds of friendship and connection through this friendly competition, this quote-unquote friendly competition in which many, many students have died over the years, but let's not pay too much attention to that, right? I, I, again, this is also to kind of 
to look at the two versions of the Triwizard Tournament that we get. The pure version of the Triwizard Tournament that is spoken of in this this excerpt by Albus Dumbledore, right? The Triwizard Tournament's aim was to further and promote magical understanding. It was intended to draw people closer together. It was intended to prove that differences of habit and of language are irrelevant in the face of our are enormous and complex commonalities, right? These things that we share are always going to be more, more important than the things that we do not share. That was Dumbledore's purpose with the Triwizard Tournament. As I've said before, I have a sneaking suspicion that the Ministry's purpose with the Triwizard Tournament was a bit of bread and circuses, was a bit of uh, a bit of flag waving to get the attention of um, of the Wizarding World in general, I suppose, and to to keep them distracted from the darkening shadows on the horizon. But we've kind of argued that out, I guess, over the course of the last several months. Um, Every guest in this hall will be welcome back here at any time should they wish to come. Is Dumbledore saying that no one here has stood in opposition to the stated goals of the Triwizard Tournament? Or is this Dumbledore being, as we've so often heard, a great man? Is he extending once more those Dumbledorean second chances? Does he believe here in the power of redemption for anyone? For Madame Maxime, even if her sin was, was as relatively minor as being somewhat out of step with her own heritage and her own identity and seeking to protect that in the face of outright bigotry and adversity? Well, okay, that's not something that we can charge her with, as it were. That's not something that we can, uh, that's not a standard that we get to choose to hold her to. That's not a failing that we get to to judge there. She is under no obligation to step up and be a representative of her people, as no one is in any uh, is under any obligation to step up and be a representative of their people. The people who do step up and seek to represent their communities, who seek to speak their truth and their diverse voices are are heroes. Those people are important. Those people are valued. But failing to do that is not the sign of an absence of virtue or an absence of heroism. This is a real world lesson as well as a fictional lesson. But we are integrating here that it is friendship and loyalty and trust and yes, love that will unite us here in the face of Lord Voldemort. We are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. Great lessons to live by as we emerge from Goblet of Fire and return to the real world after this live session is over. Yeah, yeah, good, good. I only have 15 minutes left on the clock and we have, let me double check here. Uh, okay, only three slides. We can do this thing. Let's get through it. Let's pick up with the end of Hermione and Rita Skeeter. Um, we're going to cut ahead to the Hogwarts Express here and we're going to uh, conclude this. I mentioned earlier, nine days. Nine days, you guys, that Hermione has been keeping Rita Skeeter in a jar. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. When Hermione returned from the trolley and put her money back into her school bag, she dislodged a copy of the Daily Prophet she'd been carrying in there. Harry looked at it, unsure whether he really wanted to know what it might say, but Hermione, seeing him looking at it, said calmly, there's nothing in there. You can look for yourself and there's nothing at all. I've been checking every day, just a small piece the day after the third task saying that you won the tournament. They didn't even mention Cedric. Nothing about any of it. If you ask me, Fudge is forced them to keep it quiet. You'll never keep Rita quiet, said Harry. Not in a story like this. Oh, Rita hasn't written anything at all since the third task, said Hermione in an oddly constrained voice. As a matter of fact, she added, her voice now trembling slightly, Rita Skeeter isn't going to be writing anything at all for a while. Not unless she wants me to spill the beans on her. What are you talking about, said Ron. I found out how she was listening in on private conversations when she wasn't supposed to be coming onto the grounds, said Hermione in a rush. Harry had the impression that Hermione had been dying to tell them this for days, but that she had restrained herself in light of everything else that had happened. How was she doing it? said Harry at once. How did you find out? said Ron, staring at her. Well, it was you, really, who gave me the idea, Harry, she said. Did I? said Harry, perplexed. How? Bugging! said Hermione, happily. Spoilers, Rita Skeeter is an unregistered animagus who could transform herself into a bug which Hermione caught. That explains Draco talking into his cupped hand. That explains Rita Skeeter being able to be present, even noted in the prose when... Uh, when she ought not to be present. She is overhearing all of these many and varied conversations. But she has also been imprisoned in a glass jar for nine days. Um, Hermione says that she's going to let her out when they get back to London. But she also says that the deal is this. Rita Skeeter is not allowed to write for the Daily Prophet or... Hermione is going to release the information that she has about her. She is an unregistered animagus. That is going to be a big problem for Rita Skeeter going forward, right? That is going to probably destroy her career and lead to, you know, severe criminal penalties from the ministry. Um, there is no part of that arrangement that requires Rita to be in a jar for nine days. Rita is an animagus. She is not, and this is kind of Quasi-canonical, I suppose, right? But there is this idea that if you transfigure yourself into the form of an animal, this is, uh, 
does this come from Quidditch through the ages? I think this comes from Quidditch through the ages, which is also like a weird bit of discontinuity with this book because of Victor half transforming himself into a shark during the second task, right? Um, if you transfigure yourself into an animal, then apparently you become that animal and you have no more conscious thought and you have to be transformed back by another wizard. That's the transfiguration version of, of, uh, because of the Animagus magic, I suppose. But if you are an Animagus, as Sirius Black is, for example, when he is in uh, dog form, you are still you. You are still aware and Rita Skeeter has been un lawfully imprisoned by one Hermione Granger for nine days now. This is not justice. This is punishment. This is retribution. This is Hermione absolutely taking the law literally into her own hands and then stuffing it inside a jar. We may not feel bad about what happens to Rita Skeeter. We may even believe that this is justified by Hermione, but it is another assault on the idea of justice in the wizarding world. And it is also simultaneously Another example of our desire to, to attribute evil, to attribute negative human interaction and negative human emotion to flawed individuals rather than systematically flawed structures. Rita Skeeter is evil. She is awful. She wrote those terrible stories and caused all this harm, so I'm going to keep her in a glass jar. That has a juvenile sense of justice to it, right? She's a bad person. She deserves to be punished, and Hermione might as well be the one to do it. But Rita Skeeter didn't publish those stories. She wrote them, but they were published by the Daily Prophet. They were published by Witch Weekly, right? They were published by, by creative endeavors that are staffed by innumerable people, dozens, if not hundreds of people. There is a systematic problem at the heart of the wizarding world, a systematic problem which is tacitly acknowledged in this very uh, slide when Hermione asserts that Cornelius Fudge is ordering the fourth estate, ordering the Daily Prophet to stay quiet about Voldemort's return. Nothing here is fair. Nothing here is transparent. Nothing here is just. Hermione is absolutely taking matters into her own hands which again, might feel to us intuitively, emotionally satisfying, might feel emotionally cathartic, like maybe we can believe in our darker moments that Rita Skeeter deserves this kind of treatment, but this is not just. Intellectually, we cannot, I think, sanction this. Um, yeah, yeah, as Jackie says here, uh, no, punishing someone according to our own standards isn't forgivable. Hermione's really messing up here. Yeah, as Nikki says, I never understood why she had to trap her. Why not just threaten her with the knowledge you have? Which is, by the way, Nikki, you're completely right because that is exactly what Hermione has done. She has already apparently come to the agreement with Rita Skeeter that this is what is going to happen. But also, I'm just going to keep you in a jar until we get back to London. What possible good is served by that? Well, there is no possible good that is served by that. This is retribution. This is punishment of someone who has dared to cross the power trio. I have a real problem with this, I have to tell you. Like, like Rayla Lynn asking, how justified is Hermione? I got to tell you, I think not at all justified. I think this is super problematic. It gets a pass because A, we all hate Rita Skeeter, and B, because we spend no time on it whatsoever. We have like three pages of the book left at this point. We're going to spend no time thinking about this whatsoever. It is just a tiny little resolution to a subplot that has by this point become completely inconsequential. How long has it been since Rita Skeeter was actually present on the page? It's been forever. So yeah, it's a resolution to a minor subplot, but hey, at least it's a subplot that gets a resolution, unlike the SPEW campaign, for example. Um, okay, Gildarts Winters is throwing forward to remind us what Rita Skeeter will someday do, which is absolutely fair. No one is saying that Rita Skeeter is a good person. We are saying, I think, that, that Hermione is not empowered to punish Rita in this fashion, that Rita ought not to be punished in this fashion by anyone, that this is... This is, yeah, this is, uh, this is, this is problematic. Yeah, yeah. And Nikki's saying, okay, okay, but would we, would we be okay with it if it was Umbridge in a jar and not Rita? Be more okay with it. Not going to lie, Nikki. I mean, we'd be more okay with it. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, yeah. So, uh, and yes, to bracket that, nine days from June 24th to July 3rd. That is how the timeline works out, Sarah, uh, works out here. So Rita has been imprisoned in that tiny little jar for nine days with her full human awareness the whole time. It's pretty bad. Okay, two more slides. Here we go. The rest of the journey passed pleasantly enough. Harry wished it could have gone on all summer, in fact, and that he would never arrive at King's Cross. But as he had learned the hard way that year, time will not slow down when something unpleasant lies ahead. And all too soon, the Hogwarts Express was pulling in at platform nine and three quarters. The usual confusion and noise filled the corridors as the students began to disembark. Ron and Hermione struggled out past Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle carrying their trunks. Harry, however, stayed put. Fred, George, wait a moment. The twins turned. Harry pulled open his trunk and drew out his Triwizard winnings. Take it, 
he said, and he thrust the sack into George's hands. What? said Fred, looking flabbergasted. Take it, Harry repeated firmly. I don't want it. You're mental, said George, trying to push it back at Harry. No, I'm not, said Harry. You take it and get inventing. It's for the joke shop. He is mental, Fred said in an almost awed voice. Listen, said Harry firmly. If you don't take it, I'm throwing it down the drain. I don't want it and I don't need it. But I could do with a few laughs. We could all do with a few laughs. I've got a feeling we're going to need them more than usual before long. Obviously, pulling the vast number of slides that I had to pull tonight, I didn't have time to get into the confrontation with uh, Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle right there on the Hogwarts Express. Uh, an interesting bit of, of comedy. Again, another bit of like mm, potentially problematic uh, catharsis. They're like, I understand, I understand the immediate and somewhat uh, somewhat shameful pleasure that we take from from Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle getting zapped uh, with this combination of spells, this unexpected combination of spells right there. But yeah, again, also somewhat problematic, somewhat problematic that we are engaged in this kind of behavior, that our heroes specifically are engaged in this kind of behavior. I'm acknowledging this beat here only to really note two things. The first, Harry's enormous generosity, right? Which is colored slightly here because he genuinely doesn't seem to want this money. This money is tainted money for him and he doesn't seem to want it. But I don't have a problem asserting that Harry is generous because Harry has always been previously unfailingly generous, right? We can think all the way back to the very beginning of this book for, for examples well, and, and many, many previous instances, right? The first time that he meets Ron Weasley, for example, pretty pretty generous right from the jump is, is Harry Potter. But also that beat right there at the end, listen, said Harry firmly, if you don't take it, I'm throwing it down the drain. I don't want it and I don't need it, but I could do with a few laughs. We could all do with a few laughs I've got a feeling we're going to need them more than usual before long. Recognizing the power of laughter and hope and community and joy fighting the shadow, that this is not going to be just a physical campaign against Voldemort. This is not going to be just a, a war of strategy and tactics. It is also going to be a war of hope and heart. This is going to be a war of, of tone and of, of, of relief in, in laughter and in our intimate relations with others in, in our inter the web of intimate connections of, of friendship and of loyalty and of trust and of all the things that Dumbledore was referring to right at the, uh, right at the end of his, um, his uh, speech there at the at the the leaving party. Um, Jackie's saying Harry makes a great donation to the Wizarding World here. Yes, I, I do also just love this. This is just very, very good. Um, I'm scrolling back up here. I missed. <laughs> Wilhelm Scream saying, what do you call 500 umbrages at the bottom of a jar? A good start. Yes. That's, uh, that an old formulation of a lawyer joke. I seem to recall that being a formulation of a lawyer joke. Uh, another one that I, I always enjoyed somewhat shamefully when I was a child was, you know, just back when I enjoyed the wordplay, uh, is what do you call a lawyer buried up to his neck in sand? Not quite enough sand. I'd like, I know, I know many lovely lawyers. Like I'm, this is, Yes. I shouldn't have started this like with two minutes left to go. And I literally have two minutes left to go because Crowdcast will kick me off uh, at, the, at the two hour camp here. So let's do the last slide, shall we? Uncle Vernon was waiting beyond the barrier. Mrs. Weasley was close by him. She hugged Harry very tightly when she saw him and whispered in his ear, I think Dumbledore will let you come to us later in the summer. Keep in touch, Harry. See you, Harry, said Ron, clapping him on the back. Bye, Harry, said Hermione. And she did something she had never done before and kissed him on the cheek. Harry, thanks, George muttered, while Fred nodded fervently at his side. Harry winked at them, turned to Uncle Vernon, and followed him silently from the station. There was no point worrying yet, he told himself, as he got into the back of the Dursley's car. As Hagrid had said, what would come would come, and he would have to meet it when it did. It is possible, particularly, I think, for juvenile readers of Harry Potter, particularly for readers who were absorbed with Harry Potter as it was being released, to still expect some kind of last-minute salvation, to still expect this book to end in the way that all other books have been, with a, uh, the, the way that all the other books have ended, with a restoration of the narrative status quo. Harry's adventure this year is over, and next year, next year he will embark on an entirely different adventure. This conclusion caps that thought perfectly. It does not allow us the comfort of complacency. It, it thrusts upon us the certainty that we are going to be dealing with the return of Voldemort and in fact that nothing is going to be the same, that we have had our parting of the ways and here we are now at the end of the beginning, as it were, literally the end of the beginning, ready to move into the next phase of Harry Potter and confront the darkness that awaits us. You guys, 
that's it for Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Let me put up my slide here very quickly so that I can show you what we are going to do. Uh, what we are going to do next time. I'm taking next week off from all my live podcasts. In fact, I'm taking a brief hiatus next week. So we're going to come back in two weeks with a discussion of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, the movie, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, Tuesday, June the 19th, 2018. I hope that you will be able to join me for that. If there is a demand for it after that discussion of the movie, I may hold one extra Q&A session just so we can talk about Goblet in general. I'm not sure. We kind of moved more slowly through Goblet than I expected to. We, we went oftentimes into more depth than I was expecting. I'm, I'm very glad that we did that. I'm thrilled that we got the opportunity to do that, in fact. Um, but I'm not sure how many outstanding points there are. So if you have questions about Goblet, if you would like there to be an extra bonus Q&A session, get in touch and let me know. We can do that the week after the movie discussion. And then we are going to get into uh, a brief vacation for, uh, for Dear Mr. Potter before we return to Hogwarts with Order of the Phoenix. We're going to talk about The Worst Witch and we are going to talk about uh, T.H. White's The Sword in the Stone. We're going to get to that too. So uh, I'll have a class schedule outlined by the time we come back on the 19th for the movie discussion. I'll have a uh, an outline of our production schedule going forward. You guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. It has been an absolute pleasure sharing The Goblet of Fire with you. I have enjoyed the book so much more this time than I have at any previous point. Um, it has really stood out to me how deft and complex and ambitious this book is and how much there is to enjoy. Unfortunately, I would like to talk a little more about the end of the book, but I really can't because I'm literally going to get kicked off of Crowdcast in like 30 seconds time. You guys, this has been an absolute pleasure. I hope that you have enjoyed this journey as much as I have. I hope that we will all get to hang out again very, very soon. I usually conclude these live sessions by saying mischief managed, at least when I remember to, that is. But instead, tonight, we're going to uh, we're going to conclude with... Uh, well, with two sets of words, I suppose. Words that we can live by, words that we can take with us out of the context of Dear Mr. Potter, out into the world around us, and we can use these to, you know, light a lantern, I suppose, and to make the world that little bit better. What would come would come, and he would have to meet it when it did. And remember, Cedric Diggory. <laughs>